Welcome to the 23rd episode of the Friday Nightmares podcast. Today we will be talking about Christmas movies and we have a very special uh, guest who has joined us. But first, um, let me welcome, I guess myself, <laughs> welcome myself. My name is Heather Powell and I'm coming to you today from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. And with me is... Mr. Smoke Show Crawford himself, coming to you from Swartz Creek, Michigan. Chilling with my grumbly dog. With your grumbly dog. <laughs> and his 18 cats, because he's, you know, got more since our last podcast. <laughs> God, that would be a nightmare. <laughs> and we have a very special guest with us today. We sure do. Um, this gentleman is one half of a of a podcasting team that I've been on and had a really great time on that show. I'll let him talk about that. And he's actually has been, and I think will continue to be once COVID is done, uh, very active in the horror community. And his name is Sander Kane. Thank you so much for coming, Sander. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Uh, just hanging out here in the beautiful Atlanta, Georgia on this wonderful Saturday. That's not too cold, not too hot. And, you know, it's, the city's not burning down right now, so that's nice. That that's is good plus. for that is yeah. good. You know, um, you say not too hot, not too cold, but you did send us a picture earlier of you walking your dog, and I happened to notice no snow on the ground, and that automatically no made me angry. It um, snowed wait. two Mondays ago. <laughs> wait, did no, you... no, it did not. It did. It flurried. <laughs> it flurried. <laughs> and wait, Heather, do you have snow on the ground right now? Um, we have some leftover snow. Oh, like the real had... shit stuff, you know, that like gets brown and stuff, and like oh wow, Ooh. like we have. Like zero snow here. Shut up, Scott. No one cares what you. We typically you get, uh, <laughs> for whatever reasons in our demographic, we typically get every time it does snow. Almost it goes like ice. Oh freezes, yeah. Right? So we get freezing rain, then the road ice is over, and then we get a little bit of snow, and the fucking it's the end of the world, and the whole national news makes fun of us for shutting down the interstate. But it's not the snow. I promise. It's it's literally the sheets of ice underneath it. Well, and yeah, then the snow on top of that to make it even worse. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Uh, you know, it's not that we're all stupid down here in the south. <laughs> right. <laughs> the devil's okay. dangerous has its way with us sometimes. No one thinks <laughs> you guys are dumb. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> well, I'm, origi I'm originally from West Virginia, so like I got oh. the double whammy. So, oh man, oh, you tell people that openly? I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Just kidding. Such well, big talk from fucking some, someone sometimes from it instills a little bit of fear for those that are like mm. you know really into like the Wrong Turn series. Like, oh, bro, you're from West Virginia. Ooh, yeah. You know, like, oh wait, the Mothman's there too. <laughs> Spooky shit up there. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about what I don't know if you do more than one podcast. I just know the uh, one I've been on. I currently and, only do one podcast. Okay, tell us um, a little so, bit about that and what else you do. So currently I am on the Cemetery Gates podcast, which is done with uh, Android virus. So we've been doing it off and on for, I don't know, three, four years. I think we got like 70 or something episodes up at this point, um, which we love. And it's pretty much just an excuse for me to talk to one of my uh, one of my internet buddies that I don't ever get to see. Uh, and I met him starting like in 2009, we met on a website called killerreviews.com, which at the time was uh, one of the more premier like independent horror movie websites that was on the web. Like they had a horror movie generator. You could go in and type what you wanted to see, like blood, boobs, whatever you wanted to do. And it would generate uh, horror movies for you. So I added some movies to that database back in the day. And that's kind of what got me started in podcasting and the whole thing. And I was listening to their podcast and eventually they wound up letting me on along with Android virus. And um, we just had a really great time over there. Got a lot of really great opportunities. Eventually became a reviewer at Killer Reviews and reviewed a lot of really cool movies. Got to interview a lot of cool people before they were super famous, which was awesome. Um, you know, very grateful for those times over there. It was really, really cool time. So, and it was, uh, you know, got me into some conventions uh like days of the dead convention which now does like five around the u.s all year round but now it's it's kind of uh the ownership has pretty much all changed except one guy so now i don't know anybody there but at one point i was helping out with the film festival and uh getting some movies for them on that and that was really cool um that was kind of like one of the first times like i realized that like people were starting to like recognize some of the stuff that i had did through killer reviews and i eventually wound up writing some guest spots on like horror movies, CA, uh, Johnny's Cult Films, um, I think Blood Type Online, Witch's Hat, uh, all kinds of different blogs and independent websites I did guest spots on. 
and got on a few different uh, podcasts here and there. I was on All My Heroes Wear Masks years ago, then Killer Views. Then I did a few, a small stint with Podcast Mania, some Dark Hours podcasts for a while, uh, and guest spotted a million other places. So it's been many years of lots of awesome people and great opportunities that I'm very thankful and lucky to have. So it's great to be here with you guys today. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'll say like, I've, I love you guys. I love the pod, uh, the Cemetery Gates podcast too. Like I listen to every episode you guys have released, and I enjoy it. And it's just so refreshing to hear a different side of Android virus that I am not. <laughs> on. Yeah. Not so the, the funny part is, is like when Heather came on, she was like, "What are you like?" His. She's like, "How do you keep him so tame?" <laughs> <laughs> true i don't know it's true he uh, he must know that he can't get away with shit with you and if android i don't i don't think android <laughs> listens to this but no we, i don't know love you android i don't know what uh i don't know why my guess is that since i was always like writing and interviewing people and had a little bit of a name that maybe he doesn't want to which i don't care people can take and say whatever they want i don't mean whatever but yeah maybe that's it i don't know Maybe that's just well, me pursuing... we just heard your resume, which is very impressive. Scott is up there or getting up there with his writing that he's done for pop horror. And I know he's engaged nice. in some interviewing and stuff. I just, I just tell jokes on podcasts and hopefully. Yeah, nice. it's been, <laughs> yes. So some of my highlights I can share with you guys if you'd like. Like I got to interview Ed Harris and January oh, wow. Jones and uh, Cloris Leachman. I've interviewed Harrison Smith, Adam Green, uh, Mike Holy Flanagan. Uh, Adam Albrandt, uh, Fred Vogel, a lot of the independent uh, kind of underground guys. I got in pretty good with them over a period of time. Jason Hoover, Brian K. Wow. Williams, a bunch of stuff. So That's now amazing. it's kind of funny because most of it's actually gone because all the websites have been. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. Out, yeah. So it all got like kind of weird. Like at one point when I was reviewing, I would get, I would post a review for something. Like a good example was like Hatchet 2. When that came out in the theater, I was the second review online of post to the person at FearNet. That was it. And by posting that review, I had, I don't know, 1,500 hits in like an hour and a half of people clicking the review. That's awesome. And wow. um, so, you know, the ball was rolling back then. And then, you know, I had a few other really big articles that I had written. And then Google started the AdSense stuff. And they started like basically prioritizing the links. And, th and then there for a while, that was like the death of like all these independent like horror websites. And what were really successful blogs is they couldn't catch the foot traffic anymore on Google. So when you Google a movie review, IMDb pops up and a, and a handful of other big ones and it didn't matter anymore. So like reviews went from pretty hot. Granted, that was a kind of a high profile review, but on just like a normal, not so common review, it'd be around like, I don't know, within a couple hours, it'd be at a couple hundred and then at a thousand by the next day. And then it got to be like, post review and you get 30 clicks in a week and a half and you're like the content didn't change <laughs> but it's all the google algorithm but it took down a lot of really really great uh bloggers and independent horror websites so that definitely changed uh the face of horror and independent horror for a while which is starting to come back a little bit but it's not like it was booming back in the you know 2009 2012 era but that's me yeah. being a grumpy old man so <laughs> Honestly, I think Scott is in love with you. I'm watching his face and you're talking and Scott is a man crush now. He's just like, Sander, I'm wondering if we can kick Heather off this podcast. And just I've been asking that for a while. Here. We have a we have a separate email chain between just him and I. And I can imagine, right? Oh my goodness. I'm so impressed. I'm I don't know. Maybe we should just scrap the whole Christmas thing. Sander, you're just gonna talk for the next three hours about oh, your okay. experience. I, I can easily do that. I will I will bore everybody. I'm here. Well, we really appreciate design. you being here and sharing. And uh, Scott is an excellent writer, and I'm sure you well, are too. So it's, yeah. it's, it's uh, flattering to be with two people that have experience. I want to get back in on it. I just haven't decided how I want to do it. Um, I still have a lot of great connections uh, throughout the industry. So I just haven't decided. I was for a while doing intestinal fortitude, which is where Cemetery Gates was originally hosted. Uh, but then that kind of went defunct, and we moved over to Podbean. So, And I still have the opportunity, right, for killer reviews, but the site's just like, it's not maintained. It's not, no. uh, you know, it's there. It's just not really doing anything. So I was like, I don't really know that. Or do I do my own thing? I don't know. But I have some stuff written just sitting on. I really like uh, writing essays and stuff uh, these days. I'm more opposed to traditional reviews. It's a little more fun. So Is yeah. that right? Well, I'm in grad school. Would you be willing to write some essays for me? Because <laughs> um, I fucking hate it, Sanders. So that would be... <laughs> 
I'll pay you in only Canadian on, like, dollars. Only in weird uh, French weird exploitation money. films from the 60s and 70s will I write about for you. So well, that's you don't not going to help me in my master's yeah, education. Just, you, should, you, just, you should submit that anyways, Heather. See what happens. <laughs> See what I get a grade on. I'll be like, you can't stop my creativity. <laughs> <laughs> this is art. This is art. <laughs> so be like, so you want to murder the children. So they learn better. Yes. It's fine. It's totally this fine. is clearly the way education is going. Strike fear in them and they will listen. That's the American <laughs> education system. I'm learning from them. <laughs> well, excellent. Thank you so much, Sander, for sharing. And we look no forward to this podcast and people listening to you moving forward instead of us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> enjoy the last episode of Friday Nightmares. Um, but we're going to... Into our 2020 watches, um, Sander. Please, um, when we go around, Scott and I will usually talk about the movie. If you've seen the movie, feel free to add your thoughts. Uh, yes, I have because uh, I was going to add a couple, but you guys already had them on the list. Oh, look so at this! Like, oh, perfect. Wait, so. Ballas, yeah, Ballas. ballas. Uh, so, so the first one is the call. Yes. 2020. Which one? And I believe this two. was on Net- oh, this Shutter. One. Yeah, this is the South Korean Netflix. The South one. Korean okay, one, not the yeah. Lin Shay and Tobin Bell one. No. No. Okay. No, the the one that just dropped on Shutter what two weeks ago? Yeah, I think it was about yeah two weeks ago. Same time as another one that I think we'll be talking about on the list. Yep, yeah, coming right up. So, what did you gentlemen think of this movie? We'll start with Scotty. I didn't see this one, FYI. Oh no. Okay, we'll start with Scott, Scotty only. Scotty. What did you think All right. Of this well, movie? <laughs> this movie was very very interesting. The way it all plays out, I thought it was going to be more of a supernatural style horror film and when in reality it's kind of more an alternate reality style horror film with things just kind of happening like in the present and in the past and yeah the way like the storylines connect because it's pretty much about this woman that moves into uh, a house and she ends up getting these random calls that seem like someone is in danger and she finally ends up like convincing the person that's on the call to like communicate with her and you find out that this is someone in the past that she's talking to and she's trying to help her with what's going on in the movie and then things just kind of ramp up from there and this this could have is one of those films that if not done right would have just fallen apart instantly because of so many plots. So if it was done by an American. Yes, pretty much. <laughs> it would have but, been a lot shittier. There'll probably eventually be an American remake. Oh, I'm guaranteeing there will be. Sure. <laughs> but I can but I have to say this was put together so perfectly and could have easily just like wrong one wrong thing could have just completely screwed this film up. And no, this was just an excellent, excellent film that I highly, highly recommend. So you said it's South Korean, right? Yep. I believe yeah. so, yeah. And I, think I love the- a lot of their a lot of movies that come out of South Korea. I'm usually a pretty big fan of. So they usually yeah. they're very good at like touting that line quite often, where it's just like, okay, it could go one way or the other. But and a lot of a lot of times it does go the other way. But the vast majority of the time they do typically do okay. So yeah, and this yeah. one they did it's amazing. It's a good ghost story, um, and I think the character development is very good between the two main female uh, leads. Would you and call this cur- a ghost story? I would call it, well, I think it's a little ghosty because of it going back and forth with how it goes back. And personally, maybe other people don't consider it like that um, because you're looking at a time lapse here. Oh, that's true. Right? And I think what's interesting is there was a movie that came out like this years ago and it was about a gentleman that got a radio and he was able to connect with his father. It's not a ghost story. Um, And he tries to prevent something happening to his dad. Oh, I remember um, hearing about that. Through the frequency. And I, I, what I didn't enjoy was the last, last end of the third act. I feel like I didn't get it. Um, my little simple Heather brain. So Sander, watch it and then come back on the show and explain it to me. That I would will. be great. And I was wrong. This is on Netflix. It's not on Shutter. This is on Netflix. Okay. Um, and I do think this is an example of where Netflix has really upped their game with horror, but international horror. Yeah, international um, everything. I, I would say yes, yes. I I stick to a lot of international horror, but I would. You're probably yeah. right. Other international films. Yeah. So if you if anybody listening is a fan of like crime thrillers, like with like elements of horror, there is some really great Argentinian and Span- Spanish um, 
stuff on Netflix that they've put the money behind and it, they, they're shot great and the stories are great and it's the best stuff that they have on Netflix, honestly, in my opinion. So. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. And I'll let Scotty talk about this next bad boy. All right. So this one has been getting lots and lots and lots of love through the horror community. And this one always, this is the film I was just referencing earlier with The Call. This one and The Call both came out roughly around the same time on Netflix. And this one is a Spanish horror film called Don't Listen. Um, And this one is basically about this kid that is hearing voices, which pretty much force you to do crazy things like commit suicide and other things like that. And not going to get too much into the story because there is a twist that happens. But I will say, like, this was a pretty good film. Um. I'm not as high on it as everyone else is, but I did enjoy my time with it. The characters were all very well acted. I mean, once again, it's Spanish horror, and I don't think there's been too many Spanish horror films where I have been disappointed by the acting. And uh, it's had some good creepy moments to it. I felt certain spots were a bit predictable towards, like, the end. Um, But, like, leading up to it i wasn't sure what was going to go on but this is one that i would say is uh fairly enjoyable and this one is definitely a supernatural film like total ghost story style and i'd say it's worth watching because yeah a lot of people have been finding a lot of enjoyment out of this film but this is one of those where it just it was okay for me i'm gonna say something very egocentric here i think this movie is good and we all know my love for spanish films um but I think you're only really impressed by this if you haven't watched a lot of other movies this year. Because I don't think even when it comes to ghost stories, it's one of the better ones that have come out this year, personally. I, I agree. think there's other international ones that have been better. But I think for a Netflix, you know, if you're already paying for Netflix, this is some quality that comes out here. But if I had so to choose between the call and don't listen, it would be the call. Have you seen this one, Dave? I have not, but I did have a question about uh, the kid that hears the voices. Is it just like a normal everyday kid and they put some sort of disability on him like some of the other, uh, you know, because a lot of times they'll do that. Like the kid will be autistic or the kid will be, you know, and so his heightened sense of whatever is because of his disability. I didn't know if this one was just a normal. Uh, nope, this is just a normal kid. It's just a curse that is on this house, pretty much. Yeah. Not that there's anything, anything wrong with autistic kids. Please don't nobody take it that way. And you but, heard it first, guys. <laughs> this is what Sander thinks. <laughs> Come back to Friday Nightmares. Don't go to Cemetery Gates. Um, but I, I think, I, I mean, you know, you made me just think of Come Play. Um, yes. Sander. I'm not sure yeah. if you've seen that one. But, um, but yeah, no. And you honestly don't get to know the kid for that long. He's not in it for more than the first act. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's much development. See, that's anyway. I'm, I'm gonna be giving away too much if I keep. I'll say that, that that's a big spoiler right there. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> that's what I was trying to avoid. I don't think that's a big spoiler at all. Uh, it happens always... in the first ten minutes. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't know. Scott can decide if he wants to take that out. He spoils movies all the time. I don't think. No, no, I'm just giving you a hard time because you always say I spoil. Yeah, that's because you give away the endings. I don't. <laughs> uh, we're we're uh, we're awful about spoil. Well. We used to care about spoiling, and sometimes we won't, like, if we feel it, like, really ruins it. But nine times out of ten, we're like, no, we're talking about the whole thing. Well, we try not to with our 2020s. Um, yeah. So Scott can choose to delete that if he wants to um, when he makes his decision when he's editing. Just um, edit uh, a squeaking horn into it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Actually. Right? You can do that, actually. <laughs> um, but I, I honestly think the call was a better move. If you're choosing yeah. your time, Dave, honest, I've done. Sander. <laughs> um, okay. um, if you're choosing your time, Sander, I would go with the call. I think yeah. you will honestly enjoy uh, that. One yeah, personally. I Agreed. waste my time on a lot of garbage. Shows, oh well, then so. keep wasting your time. Then. <laughs> Never mind. Don't listen to me. Uh, direct to video. This is a or, documentary. You skipped one that you watched only. Oh, I did. The closet. You must have wanted to keep it there, then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's good. Have you seen the closet, Sander? Uh, I've seen. Um, Cameron's Closet. I assume that's not the same thing because that movie's from the 70s. No, I believe this is also a South Korean film. Hmm. And it, to me, is uh, one of the best ghost stories that have come, has come out this year. I was glued to my screen the entire time. It has a 98-minute runtime. You can find this... Well, we watched it through a good friend's Plex. I'm going to assume iTunes. Yeah, I don't... 
think it's available just yet. I think it's coming out here in a couple, another week or two. On Shutter? Uh, I think just uh, to rent. A VOD. Okay. Yeah. It's worth renting. This movie is personally, I think it's an exceptionally well done ghost story. Uh, characters are very believable. It's it gets you in the feel. South Korean films, man, they like they dig into your heart and they then can. they squeeze it, and then they take it out and throw it against the wall and put it back in, and then you yeah. off a bridge. Um, Scott, I'm, you adding watch... this to my, I'm adding this to one of my watch lists. On my oh, watch, please, so. I think you will really enjoy it. Um, Scotty, what do you think? I have not seen this yet. This is what? one that, yeah, this is one I kept telling you. I'm like, I'm trying to get to it this week. I'm trying to get to it, but I just had so many other films I was trying to catch up with because yeah, like some came out last week. There was like three. And yeah. I was like, Ooh, I want to see. Yeah, and but I, I was probably... trying to catch up with Heather because all of a sudden she just went on a freaking roll of 2020 and just knocking him out left and right. I'm like, <laughs> all right, so I'm going to watch this one. I'm going to watch this one. I'm going to watch this one. And this is one that I'm definitely going to be watching before we do our end of the year show. Yeah, you got to. It is. Yeah. I. Yeah, but sometimes we have different tastes, but I think you'll at least enjoy it. Yeah, um, I think, uh, well, you know, usually if you really ooh. dig it, it's 90% of the time I do too. That's true. This is true. This is it's true. It's the exact opposite, though, with if I really dig <sighs> it, you may not. <laughs> oh my God. We're going to get to one of those in a bit. Yeah, oh. I'm excited. I don't know what is wrong with you. All right. Many things. Um, have you seen direct to video then? Did you watch that? Yes. Okay. I'll let you talk about that person. All right, so direct to video is uh, a documentary that is pretty much covering a lot of the, well, direct to video horror films that came out in the 90s. Uh, covers a lot, like a lot of interviews and uh, conversations with a lot of people from Full Moon and uh, Trauma. So it highlights a lot of those films. And Sounds awesome. Yeah, it's. It brought me back to my childhood because I watched yeah. so many of these movies. Like, because my stepdad worked for a video distribution company and would always bring uh, horror films home and just we'd add them to our collection. And it was always like the Puppet Master movies and Trancers and oh yeah, demonic toys and all that stuff. So it like seen a lot of these and they talk some exploitation and a few other things that were direct video. But I thought this was uh, a very well done low budget style documentary like felt like somebody's passion project that had a little bit of money and was like i want to make a yes you actually okay may have recognized you may recognize the director his name is uh dustin ferguson okay yeah he does a lot of the lower budget horror films yeah yeah this was one of his passion projects that he released oh cool yeah i need to definitely check that out then yeah i definitely recommend it it's a very good doc- documentary uh there's you so see, much there's so much good stuff in there from like I don't know like late like 87 88 to like 95 ish. There's just tons of great stuff that it just has slowly fallen through the cracks. I actually just picked up oh, yeah. a movie called um The Garden Tool Massacre that was like a straight oh. video from 1993. Nice. Uh, I haven't watched it yet, but it's just like a weird independent. And I think that one's like actually shot on video, so it's like a little more shaky cam, but and I, I do enjoy a lot of those shot on video style films. Yeah, some of them are great. Uh, Heather, uh, how about you? What are your thoughts on this one? I don't think I can add anything. You did such a good job, Scott. I just enjoyed it. It was a solid documentary. Um, There's only one documentary I haven't been able to get through. um, And I think it's just because I don't have the love for the exorcists that other people do. Oh, yeah. Um, I just found that one incredibly boring. But this, I thought, was very palatable. And I think anybody who remembers 90s horror straight to video will enjoy this. All the full moon babies. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, and Heather, the you are up on this one. Oh, am I the only one that's seen oh, this one too? I watched it with you, but I just did direct a video, so. Oh, okay. It cuts <laughs> deep. It cuts deep. Um, this is like Scott's movie written all over it. When I watched this movie, I was like, oh my God, it's about a relationship. Scott, you're going to like this film. So I want to know if I was right. Scott, did you like this film? <laughs> I did enjoy this one. Um, like I did really like the relationship building in this film. The story, on the other hand, was definitely low budget. And you could see that, like it's shown <laughs> through. Um, yeah, it is definitely like what you can expect when you go. You know, I want to make a horror movie, and I'm a first time director without a lot of money. Yep. And this exactly. is probably what you're gonna do. <laughs> I really enjoyed the uh, the boyfriend in this because he cracked me up because he was just he kind of reminded me of me just like saying just stupid shit mm-hmm. just to be funny. 
Um, though there is a turn in it later that I'm not really buying with him. Like that yeah. film. Yeah. But she's like, coming in all fairness. Yes. Right. But I what I appreciate about this film is I thought the characters for what it was played themselves well. It doesn't overstay its welcome. You're looking at something that's under 77 minutes. Yeah, you know, a, you watch. like it's smart. You don't drag out shit longer than you need to. It is available to rent and I recommend it to rent. I yes, enjoyed sir. it a lot. It's on iTunes, Google Play, Microsoft Store and YouTube. Yep. And I completely agree with you. And uh, did you watch this one, Xander? No, I have not seen this one. All right. Yep, this is definitely another one that I'd recommend. It's very interesting. Uh, and especially if you just dig the low budget stuff because they do. I love low budget stuff. I noticed listening to the shows a lot of times you guys do not like the low budget stuff. So. <laughs> oh, really? You haven't heard some of our reviews. One of my favorite movies this year was A Perfect Host. Oh, and it yeah. was a low budget film with Airbnb. Yeah, well, that live, live scream. And live scream. Yeah, yeah I got But there. yeah, we don't like all of them. Like yeah. they reach. Scott likes that. I think it's a piece of shit. But Scott I thought was that favorite. was okay. I, well, I, like, I think it'd be like a three out of five. Did you know it was done by um, Scott's Drama Club? Oh, God, here we go again. In Schwartz Creek, <laughs> Michigan. <laughs> they actually gave him a part, but he couldn't make it that day. You're such a So he was able to make it. <laughs> You uh, have to sign copy of the DVD, or sorry, Blu-ray, if you want it. Oh, and we'll and we'll begin to another movie. That, uh, we'll begin to another movie that Heather believes is part of my drama club as well. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Scott's drama club did that one too. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I'll jump on to the next film, which is one that I am really loving. The more I sit with it, and that is uh, anything for Jackson that released on Shutter. Which is, I'm going to read the synopsis because this is kind of a crazy, crazy ass film. For sure. But, uh, after losing their only grandson in a car accident, grief stricken Audrey and Henry, a doctor, kidnaps his pregnant patient with intentions of performing a reverse exorcism, putting Jackson inside her unborn child. It doesn't take long to figure out Jackson isn't the only ghost the grandparents invited into their home. Now it's a race against time for the couple as well as the pregnant woman to figure a way out of the haunting they've set upon themselves. And right off the bat, I have to say the director apparently has done nothing but Hallmark Christmas movies. And this is his first foray. Which I watched this week. He's been holding out on us. It is, and his name is Justin G. Dick or Dyke D-Y-C-K. I'm not sure how you would pronounce that. But uh, all right. But yeah, like I'm I heard it was a guy that did hallmark movies i'm going wait a minute okay what the what? Um, this is gonna be terrible and then i watched it and was completely and utterly creeped out by some of the scenes in this film like there were some extremely shocking and unnerving moments for something that i did not expect to like originally yeah i i, I like this one a lot as well it does have a lot of like oh oh crap moments like i didn't okay yeah <laughs> And it definitely does. It has a really great job with uh, sound editing in that one too. Like the music yes. is fantastic. Uh, there's certain things that happen with some of these other things that come into the house that I don't necessarily want to give away, but like it's a very specific sound that you hear and it comes through and you're like, wait a minute. And then it's revealed to you and you're like, holy crap. Uh, it's, it's super fun. I think the actors are great. Julian Richings is a character actor that's been in a million things. Um, he's been in... Uh, Urban Legends, uh, 12 Monkeys TV show. He's got like 215 IMDb credits. You would recognize this guy from something. TV, uh, horror movies. He's been in some X-Men movies. He's been in Superman movies. He's he's everywhere. Uh, he's just a good, solid character actor, and he knocks it out of the park, I think, in this one playing the Doctor. Uh, so yes. that was a huge, huge, huge positive for me that he was in it. And Heather, what did you think? I don't think I can add anything that you gentlemen haven't already said. It was a very well-filmed movie. It used... Um, I believe a lot of practical effects very well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was some very good people with additional talents yes. that were in this film that were exceptional. Um, the plot moved quickly. It was a palatable watch, an easy watch. It startled me at times. Yeah. Like there were times where I was like, ah! <laughs> that's, always, <laughs> that's always a good sign when it makes you jump, right? Um, now, unfortunately, it's not on Canadian Shutter. 
So for my American oh, that's right. readers, you can access it. Um, I had to get it by other means. But uh, for everyone living in the US and possibly Australia, maybe Tim Davis and can comment on whether they have it in uh, Australia, but it is available on Shutter. Yep. And, uh, and I will say this is uh, definitely top 10 material for a lot of people. Th- oh, yeah, yeah, this is tough. For the year, this is in my top five, hands down. There's no way this doesn't make it in my top five horror films. I'm thinking I don't, the same I don't, thing. I don't see, like, the more I think about it, I'm like, no, no, you're in the top five. Yeah. <laughs> here's your here's your rose. You get to go to the next level. <laughs> Nothing. I've always wanted a rose. <laughs> <laughs> my dream, you know, one day. <laughs> well, Christmas is coming, so. That's true. You never know, right? You never know. Um, is it my turn next, guys? Yes, it is. Uh, Freaky 2020. Have you seen this, uh, Sander? No, I'm really on the fence about it, though. (laughs) It was two, and I think it's a Bloomhouse picture, right? It is. I have a a very happy death day. Yeah, pretty much love hate relationship with Bloomhouse. They can do a lot of stuff really great, and then give you some of the worst garbage that's ever been put on screen. I I don't understand it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the best like definition I've heard. Well, because they make like the Invisible Man with Elizabeth Moss, which was fantastic. Um, and then they made some of those Hulu movies that are just awful. Like the End of the Dark series, like there's like, they're terrible. There's like a couple of them that are watchable, but none of them are really oh, man. very formulaic. And funny. I'm like, okay, Bloomhouse. But I look at those as pop, as I call bubblegum horror. They're not real for real horror fans. You're showing that to people that are like, like, how do I want something scary, but not too scary? You know, and you, and you throw the, on that shit. The right? soccer mom, what would they label yes. the soccer mom yes. horror club? Yes, <laughs> yes, that is the best. That's a really I'm good I'm an edgy movie. mom. I watch Hulu in the dark. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's exactly who it's for. Exactly. Um, this when I Hallmark will say, movies don't cut it anymore. Into the dark. <laughs> I want to step up my game. <laughs> I'll show Susie at the potluck. Um, so if, <laughs> Goddamn mashed potatoes taste like garbage. <laughs> so this movie, I can say, is better than Into the Dark. Um, if you gotta like Vince Vaughn, that is the only... Yeah, you know, which I love Vince Vaughn and, and just about everything. So I can't actually think of a movie I didn't like him in. So, so then you will like this because okay. he he steals the show. He's like If he's like his funny. character in old school like in Wedding Crashers, I'm in. Um, um no a, no no like not, the zany hey. oh yeah he's zany he's he's yeah. definitely zany um i think it's worth the rental i think it's a great horror comedy i think for some people it will be their favorite horror comedy of the year do i think it's that level no i think there's other movies that i found funnier but i i think it's very palatable easy to watch and you could show it to like maybe someone who kind of likes horror but doesn't like horror and you want to just watch a kind of horror movie that's yeah. not really a horror movie and watch it. Um, yep. What do you think, Scotty? I'm pretty much right there with you. Uh, this, though, I would probably put it up like it may be in my like contention for best comedy horror for the year because, mm. man, I was laughing my ass off at some of these scenes and fucking uh, Vince Vaughn just doing what he does and just like the way he's portraying like a what was a 15 year old girl is freaking yeah. hilarious yeah and though when he is when he's the killer he's actually intimidating as fuck yeah like, he does a good oh, yeah. job yeah he's yeah. very intimidating as the killer yeah. and then when he's like when he switches it off and goes right to the 15 year old girl it's like holy shit it's just it's like a light switch just like yeah. the way you can switch between them and it's and it sounds like he's a great casting for that because if you've seen him in um like domestic disturbance and that's the movie i was referring to before he, yeah she was even, telling me about that one the psycho remake the gus van Zandt psycho remake he actually does a really good job of being like creepy but it's weird because he could, he's quite can go from one end to the other but i think it's probably for him it's going to be a little more reliant on how well the script is written yeah he can yes. pull it off but he's definitely got that range which is super impressive yeah and i have to say um for i did not expect this film to be as violent as it is either like there's a lot of good gore in this film and it was like supposed to be full mainstream in theaters too yeah. right yeah, yeah. I, think yeah it it was, it did, I think it lasted one week in my theater before that we got the shutdown again yeah um, but yeah, I'll bring up the next one. Which oh, we got to is... say where we can find it. Oh, yes. It's um, iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, Microsoft Score, and for my Canadian brothers and sisters, it is now f- officially on Cineplex, which is our major um, 
go to. So um, how basically Canada has been handling COVID is everyone's put into specific regions. So some areas may have theaters, some areas may not. So they waited a while because it was still playing in theaters in different areas of Canada because Canada is big. For my American friends, it's it's large, just it's so we're clear. Very huge. There's multiple provinces. I do not live near BC. So she lives in Winter Wonderland, people. <laughs> no, I do not live in <laughs> I love BC. Scotty. BC but... See, the fact that you know where BC is already yeah. makes me like you more. Yeah. Um Spent and if you two know, weeks there well, see, two summers ago. See, there we go. An a knowledgeable person. So this took a while, but it is now on Cineplex for renting for anyone in Canada who wants to support Cineplex. And please support Cineplex. They need our support right now. Please rent it from Cineplex if you can. So that's my PSA for Cineplex. <laughs> and then uh, I will jump into the next film, which I believe this one is uh, to rent on Amazon. And it is called Snatchers. <laughs> Yeah, it is. This movie. All right. This movie is about pretty much a teenage girl ends up having sex for the first time and she ends up getting pregnant. But the thing is, this pregnancy is not normal. It is a pretty much uh, goes from zero months pregnant to nine months pregnant and one to two days. And Whichever woman probably wishes was reality. <laughs> right, just to get it like, done let's and over be with. fucking real talk. I've never had a baby, but I've never heard some woman be like, man, I really love being swollen. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you ever had your ankles like bigger than the base of your feet? No. Like, right. <laughs> it looks really painful. So, you know, I'm sure like everyone's fantasy is for this to be a reality. Only not what happens, I'm sure. Yeah. And uh, what happens is she ends up giving birth to this kind of cute puppety looking alien that likes to attach itself to the back of people's heads and basically control them like it's a, a parasite and then it basically turns the people against them and it is freaking hilarious it's violent uh and just all around very 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 entertaining movie like this is this is also one that's in contention for uh my favorite comedy horror of the year nice yeah, it seems like the title makes a play on body snatchers. If it, you know, latching yes, on and all that stuff. Yeah, very you similar are a to that. Smart one, Sander. You got this shit. We should just step away. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, I will caveat that this is a very teenage girl uh, focused dialogue. It's very yes. millennial focused dialogue. So if you are somebody who doesn't like millennials for whatever reason, this may this dialogue may you know get on your nerves a little bit uh but i still think it's worth watching i found it very funny it's available through amazon itunes google microsoft score and youtube and then the next one a spontaneous mm. have you seen this one sander no but it sounds like it's about combustion am i right <laughs> close very, very close. much Damn. um I, I guess scotty i'll let you i kind of just because I thought you were busy at that moment, I went through and just read the All next right. movie. But I'll let you talk about this one if you want. All right. This one is on the verge of what I would call more of a drama than horror film. Mm -hmm. But the horror elements is these kids in this high school just sitting there doing their normal, normal day when all of a sudden one student just explodes into a pool of blood for no reason. And then all of a sudden it just starts happening to all the rest of the students in this high school at random times and pretty much puts them into quarantine where they're getting tested and all that stuff, trying to figure out what's going on. They think it's some type of viral disease, but this pretty much is a coming of age story that has a very, very strong uh, focus on teenage relationships and a lot of the teenage angst that comes along with growing up as well. But man, the acting in this is incredible. The character building is amazing. It's got some funny, uh, like, light moments to kind of give you some levity. But this is a very, very serious, pretty heartbreaking story that, yeah, it left me, like, feeling very sad but at the same time like this is such a well done amazing film that i highly recommend anybody watch this yeah see that's a great thing for me like a lot of people are like oh i was like well that movie really like messes with your head and like upsets you and you know makes you feel like a very specific way like oh i can't believe you do that but to me it's like that's like the thing about these movies is like 
when you really like do a lot of things really well from like a story standpoint and manage to put it together on screen and when all the pieces align like it has a very lasting effect on you and like it's it's true art you know it's, yeah. it's art so it's good yeah, stuff you- i definitely put that on the list yeah, and when you have when you can get a film that just pulls on the emotions like that, it's impressive. Yeah, like and you've seen this as well, Heather, right? I I have. Now the only criticism I have of it is it reminded me very much of Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist from two thousand and eight. I oh, actually it? felt without the clear plot thing that was integrated into this film, it walked a very similar line. Okay. Um, which is fine. That was a good movie, but it, I definitely went into it thinking it was going to be a more of a horror than it was. Um, I think if I had walked in knowing it was going to be more along the lines of like a Juno as well, like just how the acting and the dialogue is, it reminded me very much of Nick and Nora, Juno, um, which is fine. It's, it's just not a fast paced movie, but a very enjoyable movie and a very well acted, the young actors that are in it do a phenomenal job. All of them probably have a very bright future ahead of them. I hope. Yeah. Um, especially the young man that's in it. I think, I think I've seen him in other things. He looked Um, very familiar to me. He looked very familiar. It is available on Amazon, iTunes, Google, um, Amazon to rent or prime, I guess, um, depending, I guess, where you live for prime and Microsoft store. Yeah. Uh, high recommend for me for sure. Now for the fun. Dum, dum, dum. So the next film on the list is the castle freak remake. That was an exclusive on shutter dropped. I think the same day as anything for Jackson. And this pretty much is a different take yeah. of, Oh, sorry. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> but pretty much a different take on the Castle Freak movie that Stuart Gordon did back in the 80s. Um, it, instead of being a young child that is blind, it ends up being an older woman, uh, like her and her boyfriend, like drinking at a party. They get in a wreck, and she ends up being blind from the wreck. And then later on finds out that she has inherited the castle that is hiding a monstrous beast within its walls and this is a very Lovecraftian horror film Mm. and actually takes the story of the cast I forget the name of the book that Castle Freak was based off of or the short story but takes that story and then has three or four different stories of Lovecraft's implemented into this to give you because Castle Freak was more like just like monster movie monster hiding in the walls this one is definitely more lovecrafty and has a lot of the elder god talk and like summoning the old ones and even brings in the necronomicon and all that so of course you know lovecraft scott it i i fell in love yes heather i know the acting is pretty bad it is some of the worst acting i've ever seen um (laughs) your drama club could have done better and uh (laughs) But I will say, like, I really enjoyed this because it had some great effects. The monster was really freaky looking. Uh, practical effects were really done well. And I really did enjoy the story because of how it brought in the couple of different stories from Lovecraft. Yeah, the, the original Castle Freak is based off The Outsider. Yes, that was the name of it. Yeah. Yeah, never forget the name. Like, uh, Jamie Sammons and Brian Sammons from ABC's The Hidden Horror talked about what other books were implemented into this movie and, and, and I forget which ones they were yeah but yeah i highly recommend this one like if you're a big lovecraftian fan now on the opposite end of the spectrum <laughs> heather um i agree that it was well filmed the practical effects were exceptional sounds like reluctancy right there um but the acting was fucking atrocious just got it was it was some of the worst i've ever seen there's one part and I don't care if this is a spoiler. It's a sex scene and someone's fucking masturbating in a stairwell beside them. It's fucking stupid. It, it, What's wrong with it's that? It's a porn. It's a porn. The, and you see the, so much. When the mood hits that's you. that's fine. Yeah, when the mood hits your eye like a pizza pie. You know. Look, we all know yeah, I like the mood. Who are we to okay? judge the most primal, like, you know. I don't judge. Desire. Trust me, Sander. I am all about <laughs> being down to pound. But this movie, I was watching and I was like, you gotta be fucked. And the, some of the characters are so over the top, like, I'm a bitch. I'm a nice girl. I'm a dick. And I just, I, I think that if this movie had got better actors and a better script, it would have been better. 
Yeah. I think well, it was a beautifully filmed movie. I think the practical effects were awesome. I think um, I have to watch it now. And I yeah. think that they there was potential, but the poor acting and the poor delivery of the lines it. and the poor written yeah. film, this would never even grace a top 10. I don't believe in right. doing bottom 10s, but if I did, it would be a bottom Ooh. 10. Now, this yeah. would be my top 20 out of the 200 yeah. some odd films I've seen. Yeah, yeah. So, so for... I guess it's just the way that I kind of got like into horror was like really on like the independent, like lower budget stuff. So like for like acting, I almost always can give a pass on yep. if everything else is good. Like if the writing is, is solid and sound and if everything else is handled, the writing well, is not solid can, and sound. I can it's get, not. I can get over the acting. Like it really doesn't bother me. Cause I've suggested movies that people are like, the acting's fucking atrocious. I was like, well, but who cares? They're like, I care. I'm like, Oh, Okay, sorry. <laughs> I think you'll feel very different watching this film, Sander. Unless I'm gonna watch really it. I'm gonna watch it tonight. Now. Poems. Like, yeah, I have if a you're feeling... like, I like softcore poems. Hey man, I love silk stockings. And okay, then you know what? Maybe this will, you and Scott will definitely. Yeah. I'll enjoy say, this I have movie a feeling. Now. If anything, Xander will probably uh, land somewhere in between us. At the very well, least. it's gonna happen this weekend. I'm gonna watch it tonight or tomorrow morning. So we actually yeah. want you to leave and watch it now and come back. Right, yeah. <laughs> and pause. <laughs> no, we're gonna keep going, but we <laughs> we'll just talk about it. Yeah, right. We, just follow my you, name when you need me. I'll focus. Right. We you. want midway updates throughout it. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, if you are interested in watching it, you can I find am. it on I. <laughs> I am going to watch it. I'm like, why? Um, why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> you can watch it on iTunes, Google, Shutter, Microsoft Store, and uh, YouTube. And it is available in Canada if you feel like torturing yourself, my Canadian. Friends. Or if you feel like giving yourself an amazing Lovecraft Yeah, or you need something to like get you going. So then yes. should I go in with the expectation of just like completely removing the original Castle Freak out of my mind and try to vision it as um, something? Or is there some like nods to it at all I, there are some nods to it but i would say this is more of a like clean slate and oh yeah almost kind of like a clean slate that takes the outsider storyline and then just builds on it and adds more to it okay cool i'm in all right and it looks like uh these four are all you xander they're all me any. you haven't seen any of them nope I've these are ones one. i have not seen i've seen one of them nice all right uh well two of these are there's only one way to see two of these so uh, the first one up is Last Thanksgiving uh, from 2020. Uh, this is an independent release from Scheme, Scream Team Releasing, who does a lot of really great independent um, releases of movies. Like one of the cool things they do, if you're not familiar with them, they'll when a movie first comes out, they'll offer like signed editions, so you can get it signed by the cast and the crew and everything. Nice. But uh, Last Thanksgiving is about a a family of cannibalistic like people that have like uh, pilgrim heritage. They're not technically like actual pilgrims but like it's in their bloodline or whatever and they get pissed off because the restaurant's staying open for thanksgiving and one of the characters that works at the restaurant has like a big falling out with her family she just is a typical teen that hates her mom and dad and she just goes to work like mad at her mom and dad and venting about how awful they are and then this family of you know comes in and decides to slaughter every one of them and then from there on it's just like a cat and mouse game of like how the hell are they going to escape these crazy ass pilgrim people uh but it has a lot of really good like effects it definitely like harkens on that like 80 vibe like it's 80s vibe it's shot like with a little bit of grain to it um the sets are all kind of i wouldn't say they're like perfect 80s sets but they do make an attempt to make things like dated looking as far as like props and where they're recording and the vehicles that are around so it doesn't Gives you a pretty good vibe, uh, an 80s vibe to it, even though I don't even think it's technically set in the 80s, but that's just kind of what they were going for. Nice. Um, but as far as like a Thanksgiving like slasher film, I think this one kind of checks most of the boxes. You know, we don't have a ton of really great Thanksgiving horror flicks. No, there's um, only like technically two good ones, I would say. Pilgrims and Blood Rage. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And to me, and both Rage of those is... Is, I didn't like Pilgrims. Well, it was okay. And then Blood Rage is fun to watch once for me like it was fun to watch one time uh and this one uh you know it's i think it's a great independent like little weird slasher holiday uh release so but unfortunately the only way you can get it is buying it from scream team right now it's not streaming anywhere how much so, is it i think it's 19.99 okay so, so that's and if you want it if you want it signed canadian okay yeah, if, you, <laughs> if you want it signed by the cast and crew i think it's like 23.99 they don't charge they charge like four or five bucks more for a signed copy 
uh, but honestly, it's it's a cool it's a cool attempt at a Thanksgiving slasher, and I will definitely watch it again uh, around Thanksgiving time. I think it was pretty cool. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say expect like amazingness from it. I uh, really gotta uh, just appreciate the stuff that it does do, and I, and I really did, and I thought it was solid. So I I recommend the last Thanksgiving. If anybody feels so inclined to check it out, please do. I will try to find it. Yeah, yeah. I think it's on our good friends Plex actually. Okay, is it? Okay, I think so. And then we're, we're bad people. So. We are. Oh, we support when we can. People. I know. Oh, I get it. It gets expensive. I yes. <sighs> yeah. So, uh, I guess I'm just gonna roll into the next one. Yeah, keep rolling. Keep rolling, right. rolling, rolling. So, up oh, next please is, don't. Uh, <laughs> what? No L M L I M P B I Z. Up next is Range Runners, uh, another 2000. And this was technically filmed in um, 2019 and did a little bit, but it eventually got its release the 22nd of, uh, not 22nd of this year. It's re- it will be released on physical copy on the 22nd of January, but it is available on Amazon Prime streaming free right now. Oh, and it's a, about a woman who has a love for hiking and decides to go on like what it doesn't really say, but it seems like she's doing like a segment of the Appalachian Trail or something like her sister's coming in and dropping her off um, supplies and stuff every so often. And you, you eventually find out her father passes away and her and her father had a really tumultuous relationship where he was very um, almost militant at her training for track running. And obviously in her eyes, she was never good enough for her father. And there's, so it's definitely like a stymied relationship. And so this lady goes out to find, basically kind of find herself and find her peace, but she gets in a situation where she comes across some other hikers that are there uh, up to no good. They're in trouble. Have poor intentions. They're, they're in trouble, so they wind up having, uh, you know, they kidnap her and, you know, all these other things start happening. And it's a lot of flashbacks in the movie from her, whatever situation she's in in the movie, it'll flashback to a scene with her and her dad. And that's kind of like how she musters up the courage to like go on, um, which I like a lot of this movie, but I felt like the flashbacks were, they almost all were too long. Like at a certain point you get it. You're like, okay, we get it. You and your dad didn't get along. And I think this movie clocks in at like an hour and 50 minutes, which is oh wow, uh, far too long. And it's, and it's not that it's bad. Like it's like, she does great as the lead. The story is solid. Um, even the bad guys in there are good and it is it is interesting watch it's just like you really for me like I felt like every flashback scene with her dad after the first two they're all like a minute and a half too long and it's just like like, okay we get it I want to see what happens with the story I get it she's gonna you know use that for inspiration and you're gonna find out like you know at her core who she is Uh, but all in all it's just okay it's nothing amazing Um, just runs a little long but I would say check it out it's kind of a different um, horror film they don't really it's filmed in the woods so there's nothing like elaborate or crazy set wise or anything like that but it is an interesting story so i'm so say, gonna watch this movie this yeah. totally is like up my alley Xander. yeah, say this oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah i will say that it's just that the runtime is way too long like mm. it needed to be i would say an hour and 30 an hour and 35 probably would have capped it there's a lot of excess that could be cut out of the film that would make it a better film because like i said i don't think it's a badly made film at all it's just it, it goes so long by the time you get to that last like 20 minutes they do like three flashbacks in a row you're like okay that's enough <laughs> yeah this sounds like uh one of those movies where i will make sure to be watching it while i'm working just to kind yeah. of help like, you, honestly you time. could you could you, you could follow along with it that way you really could it's not like a crazy in-depth story it's just not so that's awesome thank you for bringing these by the way it's no uh problem. scott and i do watch a lot we have watched a lot this year but it's always nice when people bring new stuff that we've never heard of yeah um, well, i intentionally tried to pick stuff that uh i couldn't see on you guys' letterbox so oh that's awesome thank you yeah. um it's also available on itunes google and microsoft store and youtube um for canadians because i don't think we can get it on prime so if oh that's right they do different right so if any canadians are interested that's where we would get that and you, and the next one i have seen oh that's cool yeah. All right. Uh, do you want to do it? You no, you go it? ahead and I will All comment. Right. Okay. So this is another 2020 film, obviously. This is May the Devil Take You Too. And it's technically a sequel to May the Devil Take You. And one of the things I really liked about this is how they kind of spun it into a sequel. So what you get here is with, if you've seen the first one, 
the people left at the end of the movie happen to be in this one. And the way they tie it into the sequel is a group of people that are experiencing kind of similar things. And they feel since they survived, essentially they survived the first movie that they can assist them in their problems. Um, and it's all about like, you know, conquering the devil and fears and it's uh, brother or it's uh, two sisters. They are sisters, right? Yes. Yes. I believe they're sisters. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just them. They get, you know, they get kidnapped by this group of people. It's them trying to fight their way out. And of course, there's a backstory of a, I guess, was he a foster father or was it? Yeah, I haven't seen or? it. I saw it a couple of weeks ago now. So it's a little fuzzy. Yeah. So um, I can't, it's, he, I think it's, he, I think he's just a foster father. I think it's not so like too. like a technical orphanage. And it's a guy that has like these seven kids, but he abused these kids. And yes. there's all sorts of like, each character has their own like issue with mm -hmm. what had gone on. Uh, but it's, I think it's a pretty cool story. Uh, I really, I just really liked how they made it a sequel. And I still yes. like the lead characters and it, she's great again. And I, and she's like battling through all the turmoil that they're kind of putting her through and all these other things. I think there's great p practical effects in it. Uh, there is some, it almost loses you a couple of times because of some bad CG at a couple mm. points. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But like uh, overall, like I just enjoyed the story so much. And like, I love the little, the like dilapidated house that they filmed it in uh, was really great. The sets were great. The sound was great. I was able to overlook that CGI stuff and a few other minor things that I didn't agree with, but I thought it was a great little like spooky possession demonic film. Nice. I agree with you. I think the only thing I would add is that yet again, Netflix put, you know, pulls it out internationally and always brings the best. And I think this is better than probably other. Wasn't this on a shutter? Um, I think it was Netflix, wasn't it? So the first one, oh, yeah, Netflix. Netflix. The second one is Shutter. Is the second one Shutter? Yeah, the second oh, okay. One's exclusive to Shutter. It's weird. But that's the first movie I've ever seen where one was exclusive to Netflix and the sequel was exclusive oh, to Shutter. Yep, you're right. It is. That yep, is weird. Yeah. yeah. Um, I really appreciated that it was just, it was a really decent ghost story. I don't think it'd be my top ghost story because I didn't see the first no. one. And well, the I first do think good. the first I, was good, but I would argue that this one actually. There was things I liked more in the second one than I did the first one. So, really? Yeah. It's a solid sequel for, uh, you know, normally you don't get good sequels out of stories like this, right? No. You really don't. So the fact that we got one that was very watchable and entertaining was, was two thumbs up for me. Awesome. Yeah, no. So it's on Shudder and you can access it in Canada if you want to like to watch it on Shudder as well. Yeah. And, and then you got the last one. Got the last one. So this is actually another one from Scream Team releasing just because I happened to buy this in the last Thanksgiving at the same time. Nice. Uh, this is Spine Chiller, uh, another 2020 movie. And the whole idea here is it's like a little anthology film, but it's wrapped around this Spine Chiller event, which is an annual Halloween dance. And they just kind of go from story to story. And I think there's four different stories about all the people that are invited to the dance and how their little spooky stories all kind of align up. It starts off really slow and like it's like nah, but it does finish strong. Not the best anthology in the world, not the best anthology in the world, but it does hit a lot of uh, really good spots in there. There's a few good practical effects scenes. Obviously, I didn't have a ton because it's a pretty low budget film, uh, mm. but for you know for what they had and what they did, I thought it was it was entertaining enough. Uh, I would just kind of you know another anthology film. We have a ton of them, you know, so. I like it like a, a lot, actually. Yeah, like I hold this one up. So there's another one called 1031. Yes, I actually really watched great. that this year. Uh, the Mortuary Collection, which is really oh great. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, yes. So yeah. there's a lot of other really good like Halloween anthology movies. So it's like hard to like say this one is super awesome. But I do think it's a great admirable effort and it's worth checking out. And there are a few little things in there that I really did like about Spine Chiller. But uh, like I said, it started slow. But in the grand scheme of things, it's really not even that long. I think it's like an 83 minute movie. So you're not looking at anything really drawn out. If you're looking for something different, uh, something a little independent you want to support, I think this one's worth checking out. That's awesome. awesome. Thank you for bringing these. Uh, yeah, thank you. I really really appreciate well. it. I probably watched, I'll watch the three, to be honest with you. All of them yeah. sound like they're right up my alley. Yeah. Um, and I'll never watch Castle Freak again. Um, yes, you will. You're watching. We're going to review it. Oh fact, my no, 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 we're not. We're going to we're going to do a commentary, commentary on it. Oh, yes. we're not. I will be um, busy. Nope. We'll no, you won't. 
<laughs> I will be like, this will be the, uh, when you come to visit, this is what, you know. The no, whole... I'm never coming to visit again. If that's <laughs> This is, this is going to be the hostage situation we talked about before where I'm going to duct tape you. See, this will be the movie I'll torture you with. I'll duct tape you to a chair, feed you kale chips and make you watch Castle Freak. <sighs> kale oh, chips? Yep, because she hates think... kale chips. Oh, no. oh, let me guess. You like kale chips, Sender. Is that because I live in the city? Is, is, is it because you're woke? Is that why? <laughs> no, I actually fucking hate kale, and I wish the world would stop telling everybody it's fucking good. Thank it's you. a garnish. Get Sander, it you may stay on yeah. the podcast. Great. Even though you may like Castle Freak. Um, we're going to move. <laughs> you probably will. It's got a warning. <laughs> Um, we're going to get into our older movies. Uh, we just each brought two to the table because if not, we'd be here all day. Um, <laughs> I'll talk quickly about my two. I watched Dead End uh, 2003, which is promoted as a Christmas movie. This is not, not a Christmas Eve. movie. <laughs> oh, fuck it ain't. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, the only thing that makes They're it They're driving Christmas in the car on Christmas <laughs> to get there Christmas Day. Because they tell us it's Christmas. That's why. They're There's like, Christmas music on the radio. And, on, and they there. sing Jingle Bells. So, you know. I um, mean, it's a shoe in <laughs> I liked this. I, I watched this because Lynn Shea was on it and um, Ray Loda. Loda? Oh, Ray Leota? Ray, Ray, Ray Wise. Ray Wise. Oh, no, Ray Wise. Sorry. Oh, Ray Leota. Leota. Ooh, good um, thing Ray I'm here. Wise. And I know, I'm just yelling out Ray's. Ray, Ray, Ray. Um, Ray, Ray. <laughs> the ending, I was like, oh, fuck, come on. It was an ending that reminded me of my new favorite movie, Campfire Tales from 1997. <laughs> um, but it was, I rented that from Blockbuster. Fine. You did, you really? Campfire Tales, yeah. I bet you didn't drink and drive after that movie, Sander. Because you know what would happen if you drink or drive? You sit around and tell campfire fucking tales when all your friends die slowly around you. That's what you do. Um, but it was fine. It was on Tubi. And I, like I think it. it's, yeah, it, it's entertaining enough, but I, I it's a Christmas ending, movie. It was funny. Parts of it were funny. I don't think it's a strong Christmas movie. And, uh, but now that we know what Sanders believes Christmas movies are, I can see why he <laughs> thinks this is a Christmas movie. And uh, the uh, the ghost in that is a uh, famous model that I'm blanking on her name right now, but she is a famous model. She looks like a sh- uh, Moon, um, Rob Zombie's wife. Sherry Moon? No, yeah, it's yeah. not her. It's not Catherine, her, but right? I was like, is that she kinda does Rob Zombie's like wife? Her. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that movie. There's a, it's we did fun. an old uh, episode on all oh, my heroes wear masks on that on this movie. So it's a fun film. I gotta say, I did enjoy some of the jokes in it. I did enjoy Lynn Shay in it. I'm sure it's really funny. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, it's I Amber disagree. Amber Smith is the model. Amber Amber Smith. Um, yeah. The ending was just too cheese cheese for me. Um, <laughs> but that's me. Uh, Santa Slay now, <laughs> 2005. <laughs> this is a quality Christmas film. Uh, I watched oh this God. as well on Tubi, and I kind of went into it like when you know that Bill Goldberg is Santa, like anyone who watches wrestling is going to be like, okay, right? Yep. right, set your expectations. But that opening scene with Fran Dresser and I don't know some other uh, Chris people, Kattan and <laughs> fuck, it was fun. Like it's just stupid, but it's it knows it's stupid. It's not trying to be anything other no. than some fucking dumb Christmas movie. No, nope, this so, is like the new age Jack Frost. Yeah, like it was dumb. It was dumb and it was it was easy to watch. They had some curling shit in there, which I thought was pretty fucking hilarious being Canadian. <laughs> um, on Tubi as well, an easy watch. I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, I think it's worth watching just for Bill Goldberg when he comes down the chimney. Like yes, that, yes. that opening scene of, of Bill Goldberg. It. <laughs> and he does wrestling moves when he goes to the fucking strip club. <laughs> Oh yes, that was. <laughs> like it's, oh. just, it's funny if you like wrestling or you just like stupid fucking movies, you'll enjoy this. And both are free on Tubi. So. Yep, yeah, because I watched this for the first time this year. With, with I think shortly after you did, and oh my god, I was oh my just god. laughing just my ass off. Ridiculous, right? It was great. Yeah, it's super fun. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Xander, your two are up next. Yeah, I'm up next. Him. Look how classy he is. What are what is this look shit? Oh, yeah. So up first for me is The Beast Must Die from 1974. This is uh, Amicus Film Productions, uh, which if you're familiar with Hammer and Amicus, you know, they were some of the few great uh, studios that made a lot of horror movies back in the day. Uh, But this one also happens to star Peter Cushing in it, you know, from Dracula fame and a few other the Hammer Amicus uh, films. But this movie has like a, this movie is a really cool idea. Uh, So the idea is the movie is almost um, interactive in a way from 74, which is like groundbreaking, right? 
so it starts off and they're in a there's like a guy in the woods like running around and he's going to this castle and you're like what the hell is going on this is stupid <laughs> and then you finally <laughs> figure out he's hosting an event at his house much like vincent price in house on haunted hill nice. he has all these people here and he knows one of them is a werewolf and so he gets them all there and basically he's trying to find the werewolf to kill it and the movie like stops when you figure all that revelation out the movie stops and is like okay now it's you get to play along and figure out which one is the the werewolf and it tells you like clues will drop throughout the movie and you'll try to piece things together and then before the reveal at the end of the movie they're going to stop the screen again and give you 30 seconds to to like say your answers amongst your group and uh see if you're right on who it was oh that's cool right super cool concept the first 45 minutes of this thing are about as boring as can be <laughs> like there's nothing <laughs> there is nothing happening it's not really interesting peter cushing almost is at the beginning of the movie he he is kind of wasted but toward the end his character kind of develops into something more and more worth watching um i had really high hopes for this movie because people were like it's one of the best amicus movies that they've ever made and I, while I will agree with it was very groundbreaking for 1974 to kind of take that approach to where your your narrator is like, hey, stop, play along. Um, super cool. Would have been great to see in the theater back then if you ever had if anybody had the ability. But for me, like it was just the first 40 minutes were so boring. And like the payoff is the payoff is mediocre at best, in my opinion. There's no like super great werewolf transformation. It's just eh. Uh, so it all in all, it was just kind of OK. Uh, but I do think it's worth watching just to kind of see that kind of goofy element. But I don't expect anything like fast paced and like amazing. <laughs> like, but some people love it, but it just didn't it didn't check that for me in that box. I just thought it was, you know, me. Yeah, because I've heard of this one, but yeah, I've, I've, I've heard some good things about it. But yeah, I've never seen some it. people love it. But I think it's one of those that you just kind of have to watch and decide on your own, like either you're into it or you're not. If you love Hammer and Amicus, like. 90% of what they make, you will like it because a lot of their stuff is slow building for the first 30, 40 minutes. But in some of their movies, for me, the payoff is great. And sometimes the payoff is not great. So so proceed with caution. If you want to watch The Beast Must Die, and it was available on Amazon Prime for sure for American viewers. I don't know about Canadian viewers. <laughs> but I'll have to look later. I'll have to look that up. And then up next, I have Horror Rises from the Tomb from 1973. This is a Paul Nashi film, and I had recently picked up the two box sets that Scream Factory released on their Shocktober sale for like 30 bucks nice. a piece. And it's like seven, six movies on one and five movies on the other. So you get a good bit of movies. And if you're familiar with Paul Nashi at all, like he has a ton of movies. He's got over 100 IMDb credits. And a lot of his movies never got like, nice restorations a lot of the a lot of the reasons that we did have of his films were very poor quality they were mm -hmm. missing um you know they were missing film segments and so just a lot of like a lot of his catalog was lost but screen factory got a hold of a bunch of it and cleaned them all up and made a two beautiful box sets with amazing artwork and liner notes and all the awesome things you would ever want if this is like your genre but horror rises from the tomb uh paul nashi plays like a medieval like warlock and it starts off like um you know way back forever ago start of the movie he gets killed and his wife mistress or whatever who's a vampire also gets killed and then a couple hundred years later someone finds his head that was decapitated it brings him back and he comes kind of comes back to life and starts like murdering everything inside <laughs> so there's lots of the cool uh like cool spanish like countryside in this film like it looks really pretty it's cleaned up very nicely this is a very solid uh, uh, film from from Neishi. Some of them aren't so great. This one's very good. I think it, it's definitely like a whole vibe, right? Like it's like a lot of those films kind of feel the same. And this one's, uh, you know, I don't know where it lines up in the timeline on the Neishi films, but you know, it's really really good, and it's just a fun ride. And if you do like, it's very weird though. Like it's just a weird story. Neishi is very creepy guy, um, but like he just nails that like. Think like Bela Lugosi, Dracula, but like Spanish and a little more doom, a um, little more like dooming when he comes into the room. Like you're like, oh shit, bad stuff's about to happen. It's nice. about to some shit. But it's super cool. So I loved um, Horror Rises from the Tomb. So that's a huge recommend for me. And if you've never seen any of his films, this is actually a great one to start with. Yeah, because I'd seen uh, Curse of the Devil when I was uh, podcasting for the horror drunks and 
I fell in love with that movie and became one of my like top 10 werewolf films. Yeah. And it really makes me want to look into more of his filmography, which I'm probably going to do after this year's over with as first time watches. Yeah, for sure. I would highly recommend those, those Scream Factor releases if you find them on a good deal. Like you're just not going to find any, those particular films, you're not going to find a better like transfer. Yeah, I had the first box set and I ended up having to sell it before I got a chance to watch them all because I started just selling my collection because I realized I just never watched any physical media lately. Yeah, I've done that like 10 times, but yeah. I got to keep, like, keep physical some stuff. And these are things yep. that, um, you know, this is stuff that I, I would definitely hold on to. So just because there's oh. not a bunch of them out there. Right. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check the, this one out at some point for sure. Um, but yeah, I'll jump into my two. Uh, and as always, I know, you know, fo- like, look at the shit we followed that with. Like, look at the sandwich. <laughs> of, like, Mr. Oh. Sander coming in and being like, mm, hey guys, I see how smart I am. And I'm like, I like Tennessee. <laughs> 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 All right, Scott, you learn in with this really like up there film too that's super deep. All right. So, yeah, I, as always, I go with the theme. So since we were doing Christmas episodes, I was just trying to look for a bunch of different Christmas horror films that I've never seen before. And I've watched probably a good nine Christmas horror films I've ever seen this year, but I'm only going to talk about two of them right now. And the first one is P2, which I'm surprised took me this long to watch, but just the thought of this movie and like the synopsis and everything, I was like, okay, it'll be kind of like a cat and mouse style game or movie. And it's not really going to be much of a Christmas film. Boy, was I wrong. This actually Holy. like a, had a lot of like elements like that, you know, made it feel like it was Christmas. Um, it is pretty much a cat and mouse style movie, but Holy shit. It is done really well. Wes Bentley is over the awesome. Top. He's awesome. at it. <laughs> yes. He is great. And I was just, I had a blast with this film. Like, I'm kicking myself for not waiting watching so it. long. What was that waiting so long to see it? Is there any yes. Stuff yeah. Oh my God. Like, that I'm glad Heather recommended this one to me. Like, because, yeah, she ended up messaging me going, if you haven't seen it, watch it. I'm like, okay. Yeah. yeah I think this movie falls apart without Wes Bentley, honestly. Yeah. Um, just because there's so little change in scene you're just in a parking garage right there's so little things that change within the environment that really can like amplify it and make it any better like with a poor performance with a poor performance from another character in this movie would just be would be it would ruin it so Wes Bentley like kudos for for the performance he gives in this one it makes the entire movie in my opinion so oh it so does and that one there's that one kill in the movie that is just so freaking brutal I was like holy shit I did not expect that (laughs) Uh, but yeah, this was, I had a blast with this one. And this one I can see being a Christmas tradition for me now from here on out. Yeah. And the next one, um, I found this one on Shutter, and it is called Red Christmas. And I think this was an Australian style horror film because I think the family like is all living in Australia. But it stars Dee Wallace as the matron of the family. And she's having the rest of her family over for Christmas. And... Then someone shows up knocking on the door, just covered in rags and like is wrapped up almost like a mummy. And like, you can barely understand what he's saying. He like, you can tell he's kind of like slow, but he starts like talking about uh, abortions and B. Wallace like freaks out and kicks him out because of something that's happened to her. And she kicks him out of the house and like, they do it in such a rude way that like, you feel bad for the guy and then like he just pretty much snaps and like comes back and just starts killing and the kills in this movie are very violent and like pretty freaking awesome the characters are all fucking hateable i could not stand any of them like if and they were if there was a family like this this family should never ever ever get together ever again because this family was constantly at each other's throats. Now, and... were they wearing masks? And were they socially distanced? <laughs> this was 2016, Heather. Before oh, that was oh, a sorry. Third. But yeah, oddly <laughs> enough, they totally were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird. I don't, I don't get so it. They were trendsetters is what yeah. you're saying. <laughs> right? um, but yeah, besides the, like, the just awful characters you could not get behind, um, the kills were really awesome. Uh, kind of took offense to... Uh, 
the way they treated uh, someone who was slow and like kind of how they exploited it a bit. Yeah, I don't. I don't find it funny when we make fun of people with developmental delays anymore. No, I don't think that's funny. <laughs> this time at this stage, it's not. It's it's a low hanging fruit humor. Right, and it's, it's like they're not even really right. making fun of them, but like they just kind of exploit. They're using like just, exploitation with it, and it. Just, oh, okay. It's just kind of the like, uh, just rubbing seems me the like, wrong way. Yeah, well, I, I've seen this movie as well. Um, it just seems. It just seems like it's in there for shock value and yeah. nothing. Like there's no other. Mm. Which is like my biggest pet peeve is to throw something in the movie for shock value that really doesn't have any merit other than anything to just like push the envelope and be edgy. And be edgy, like, yeah. Like I understand wanting to make me feel uncomfortable as a viewer, but like it has to make sense in some sort of way. And this and this one, it doesn't particularly do that. So No. Now this one I wouldn't recommend. Like I'd say the kills are awesome. That's about it. Yeah. And... Yeah, like I, I just thought I'd bring this one up just to bring that, just kind of, because I haven't heard many people talk about this one, so I just thought I'd br- bring it up. Um, awesome. But yeah, that's the end of our uh, watch list, which was very extended, which I loved. Absolutely. So we'll Sorry. Get to... no, no, not that's at good. all. <laughs> that's good. awesome. We need to have, you know, expand and, you know, have culture after well, I talked about this, Santa's Slay. And especially because uh, our next episode, we will not be doing any what we've been watching. No. You're just going to hear about our awards. Um, yep. So we, we will break into... Do I get one? <laughs> <laughs> best guest award. <laughs> sorry, Tim. And then sorry, we have Daniel. best duo guest that we give to Horror for Dummies. We have yes. two awards for that. Everybody gets a medal. Yep. Everyone, uh, gets, everyone wins. We're very millennial that way. <laughs> so what we've been listening to, I can see there's multiple podcasts here, so I will not give mine in just the instant in sake of time. I don't know who cool. wrote what. Oh, um, I can speed through mine pretty quick, so it's not okay. Chill. Yeah. Um, so, but more so, just plugs the things I like. So. Oh, please plug, please, okay. please go ahead, and I'll just save mine for the next time anyway. It's fine. Okay. Um, but weekly spooky. Who yes, is? weekly okay. spooky. Well, that's me. Uh, weekly spooky was started by Henrik Kudo, who is a wonderful independent filmmaker based out of Ohio. He's done comedies, westerns, like love stories and horror. He's kind of done it all. Um on basically a shoestring budget, but he's surrounded himself by some pretty cool people and actors. So his movies are always have a certain charm to him, but he started this podcast where he, it's kind of like no sleep. He reads stories and then adds in sound effects and reads all the characters and they're in the, about 45 minutes long. Uh, but I had got, recently gotten behind on the episode. So I just basically marathoned them from like October and he's got like lots of the independent writer stories on there. And um, it's just a fun little like, Hey, you want to listen to a little short story? And he puts the, uh, you know, he does the voices and makes it theatrical, Ooh. and it's just really cool for like an like independent that. small one. Uh, yeah, but Weekly Spooky is super fun. Where can you, you find know, it? Uh, you can find it on Spotify, iTunes, um, at weeklyspooky.com, I believe as well. Awesome. So is it on Pod Podcast Attic? Uh, I'm not sure. I know okay. it's on Stitcher and okay. Podcatcher, and it's just about everywhere. So he's pretty savvy with all that. Awesome. Well, we'll include in the show notes, or Scott will, because yeah. that's his job, yep. um, links to the podcast. So we will yeah. include that. And then uh, the next one is Supernatural with Ashley Fowers. And uh, I'm not like a true crime person, but this is technically a true crime podcast. But the catch on it is like, they all have a supernatural element to it, like something really weird. Like they do an episode on like the Donner Pass. They do an episode about the Malaysian air flight that went missing so like it goes through and like Mm. basically debunks all the like actual theories and then goes through and is like well what else is left is it supernatural is it not supernatural I don't know but nonetheless it's just super interesting stories about like some pretty cool shit so it's almost like a weird history lesson of cool shit you probably never heard of so Highly that sounds cool. Yeah, and same, same areas that we can find it: Spotify, Stitcher. Yep, Spotify, Podbean. Stitcher. Uh, that is a, um, is it a Gimlet? I think it's Gimlet Radio, maybe. Uh, it's the same girl that does uh, true crime. Uh, so, yeah, she's a great podcasting host. It's just, it's just interesting. I, I really find it really interesting. It's fun. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the last one I'll talk about is one called Gaslight. And it is a short podcast. It's like eight episodes or like 20 minutes a piece. And it's just a story. Uh, it stars Chloe Grace Moretz in it. Oh, wow. Oh. She's the main character. Uh, and it's about her disappearing from her family and her friends and then reappearing a few years later. Uh, and you slowly find out that she had gotten taken into a cult. And she's like 
reconnecting with her best friend and like the story develops that way as she's like discussing with best friend very very cool very short just a cool story great production value you could literally list it all in one day so gaslight is really rad check it out it's everywhere as well i love the name it yeah. sounds like it represents a podcast it really does well, actually it does it does it's really that's clever cool. yeah that's, I, that's I absolutely really clever it. it was cool so. Well, thank you for bringing these. Um, no these are different and we haven't heard of them. So we love to spread the love to other podcasts. So thank you so much. So I guess the last no one is yours, Scott. Yes, it is. Oh, excellent. Uh, yep. This is uh, one that I had to bring up because I've been thinking about it for a while, but I've been holding off because they hadn't released an episode in quite some time. And all of a sudden they have come back with a vengeance and like <laughs> have been dropping episodes every couple of weeks. And that is the Hail Ming Power Hour with... Uh, fellow legion there are fellow legion pod uh legion network podcasts um you know, the main hosts are ricky morgan and danny bennett and ricky morgan is just all over the place has so many different podcasts that he's worked under uh was he under my wheels uh i'd say like five others uh short bus cinema uh, and the helming <laughs> power hour was like his main one that he did with danny bennett and they pretty much just cover almost all sorts of just like different genres uh they've covered cube they've covered hail ming love that movie they've uh or, Cube's a canadian film yes it was i know uh, and i meant to say uh not <laughs> sanders like uh, you don't need to tell me heather <laughs> i don't bring up fucking slant as slay okay <laughs> sorry scott that was oh you're all right but yeah i didn't mean to say uh hail ming i meant to say uh flash gordon oh flash garden nice uh, but yeah, they've covered like so many different films. They are funny as hell. They uh, have these little skits, like they go into a time machine and they use the time chicken, and you hear this like <laughs> chicken squawking and all sudden you hear, like time machine noises as they go back into the past to watch a movie. <laughs> I, I love I'm it. in it just for the chicken, so I'm in. Time and, chicken, son of a bitch, I'm in. It's hilarious because I oddly uh, like, want a time chicken T-shirt right now. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah like they just do a great job of reviewing and they just have like some funny skits in here like throughout it as well and i just can't help it but like i follow the uh fun fake drama between court psyop and ricky morgan because they'll like bash each other on each other's shows and like just talk shit back and forth and it's just and it just keeps escalating more and more and more and it's just hilarious because ricky doesn't ever swear and court's like foul mouthed and <laughs> So that's really funny oh it's it, they are entertaining as hell but yeah highly recommend the hail ming power hour they are finally back and i am so happy to see that nice awesome well thank you uh scott and sander for bringing in the knowledge i uh, will save mine till the new year um it's some um, friends of ours from the legion podcast network as well oh, nice. so um we're going to take a brief break and we're going to hear from one of our podcasting partners in crime and then we'll be back with our main topics. So after these messages, we'll be right back. Clytus, I'm bored. What plaything can you offer me today? An obscure body in the SK system, Your Majesty. The inhabitants refer to it as the planet Earth. How peaceful it looks. Most effective, Your Majesty. We'll destroy this Earth. Destroy it utterly. Send Rick and Danny in Wool Rocket Ajax. So, just destroy it? That's what Ming said. Don't you ever listen? Well, there's no arguing with Ming. Hail Ming. Wait! You see those transmissions on the visual screen? Crow? Nightmare on Elm Street? Chud 2? Black Belt Jones? Nightbreed? What's a critter? Oh, I've seen those things. Flash? I guess we could wait a while before the destruction. Yeah, and watch the movies. And talk about them. The Hell Ming Power Hour. Disobedience to Ming. For now. You can find us at Legion Podcasts. You can find us on Facebook. iTunes. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. At www. You know what? Just Google it for yourself. Just Google it, you bastages. Hell Ming. Breaking 2? Electric Boogaloo? 
Samurai cop? Army of darkness? Flash dance? <laughs> <laughs> we might destroy the planet with the flash dance. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Um, as usual, we're going to go through five movies today um, that just reflect Christmas. So we're not going to do any academic articles on Christmas or the history of Christmas. I don't think anyone cares. I think we all know movie. what it is. Ideally, it's about shopping, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Consumerism and babysitting. At its and uh, Amazon Prime, <laughs> which apparently is probably making billions of dollars this year, probably. Um, but uh, anyway, we we will be going over a couple of movies, some very known and loved movies, and then a very special movie that we're going to uh, that our guest brought in. Special movie. Yeah, Xander like comes in and he's just showing Scott and I the way, and it's really yeah. like <laughs> we're learning now. So these are just movies that we felt represented Christmas or um, other things that we decided to include, and it's going to be a fun discussion. So Let's as always, it. Scotty's going to take it away. All right. So, yes, yeah, since we are just going to be talking straight to about the movies, we can just jump right into our first one, because as always, we're doing this in chronological order of when they were released. So the first film on our list today is Christmas Evil from 1980, uh, originally titled You Better Watch Out, also known as Terror in Toyland. It is a 1980 American psychological slasher film written and directed by Lewis Jackson and starring Brandon McGart. And while not prosecuted for obscenity, the film was seized and confiscated in the UK under Section 3 of the Obscene Publications Act of 1959 during the video nasty pa uh, panic. Uh, the synopsis is uh, Comical Festive Frights, a toy maker who revels in the Christmas spirit, suffers a mental break when his work is met with hypocrisy and cynicism and goes on a Yuletide killing spree. Um, it's a brief simple synopsis for this film because yeah this is a pretty much a character study of someone who and uh ca character study and a it covers obsession and how far people will go with their obsessions and uh yeah i guess for this kind of like we did when the horror for dummies was on we'll just kind of go around and give our thoughts about it and you know see how we feel if this is like fits the christmas theme or not like how it represents christmas and uh, yeah, Xander, so I'll toss it to you real quick. Ooh, start to me? Yeah, so this is actually the first time I had seen Christmas Evil. I haven't, oh, really? Uh, yeah, no, I've, I've, I know the artwork. Um, it's just kind of one of those that always slips through. And actually, when it came on and it said, the title screen says, you better watch out, not Christmas Evil. Yep. Uh, so, like, I was like, wait, did I turn on you better watch out? Because that's <laughs> what we're talking about later. But I was like, no, this ain't it. Um, but, yeah, it's the first time I'd seen it, and I will say – the main character, what is his name, Harry? Yes. Uh, does a great uh, man on the brink, like, uh, you know, performance here. Like, when I, when I was watching him, like, my brain kept going to, like, Joe Spinell and Maniac. Like, just this weird, nervous, kind of anxious guy. And then he gets in these weird, like, uh, like, the creepiest thing in the movie to me was when he was humming Santa Claus coming to town at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And he's just, like, rocking back and forth and, like, going fucking mad, <laughs> like, essentially doing it. Uh, but like it's it's he does a really great job of 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 selling the crazy and there's a lot of really cool like small notes in here that I really liked like uh, I thought it was hilarious when he got stuck in the chimney <laughs> like he was really <laughs> stressing the fuck out um, and the whole like at the point there he's going around killing people and doing all the things but he's like it seems like he comes from a place of like genuine care yes but then he just takes it too far every single time um and it's just a, i think it's just super fun and you know he runs a or is a manager at a toy factory and that comes into play within the story and when he decides to become santa and deliver uh gifts to the kids which was kind of a weird thing like he obsesses over these kids at the beginning of the film mm -hmm. notating whether they're naughty or nice and you don't really if i mean i wasn't really familiar i heard the film but i wasn't familiar with it i was like okay where the fuck does this movie go <laughs> I like, think that's pretty much the message that Heather sent me. Like, what the fuck are we watching? Yeah, like this is gonna get really fucking intense and uncomfortable. And I see maybe this is why I have never seen this movie. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, but all in all, like I enjoyed that character a lot. I um 
I, I think he sells the whole movie. And once again, like we were talking about Wes Bentley earlier, I think without him, I, I don't think we have much of a movie. Um, I absolutely love the ending. Um, and I think it, at, there's one really interesting scene because uh, he kind of becomes Santa. And then there's a like a standoff between parents and kids. Yes. yes. I, I, I love that aspect of the scene because, you know, it's playing like how much you talk up Santa and how he's going to bring you good things. And then like all that talk of how positive and good he is in the movie, the kids believe in it. It just comes like to fruition. And it, it offers a really, really, really cool scene. Uh, and I actually enjoyed this way more than I thought I was going to. So that is awesome. I'm, I, did, I had no idea this would be your first time watch. So that just makes me excited because I know this is <laughs> yeah. Heather's first time watch as well. And that's not surprising. <laughs> Standard first time watch is surprising. Me, it's like, oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah let's get your thoughts on this heather um you know the only thing that really throws me off in these movies is they always need to include some kind of sexual trauma that's not really a trauma i i at the beginning he sees his dad but he doesn't know it's his dad dressed yep. as santa yeah hanging out down the dum -dum. leg yes yeah, staring at the dum dum box <laughs> yeah like th but that's all he does yeah he just, he just rubs the leg like I'd be like, uh, dude, you're gonna fucking do something. Like I don't have. <laughs> right, it's weird. Like you're looking through like her nightgown and presumably has other things. That, like you're just literally staring at her nightgown, rubbing her leg. And she has like obviously the very sexy um, leggings that you would put on yes. to wear like a corset or something. And I just find this weird that they seem to do this thing in the '80s, early '80s or late '70s, where they just had to throw weird sex shit in there. That somehow the trauma of him seeing his dad, not knowing it was his dad just as Santa and Santa engaging in what could be seen as naughty behavior. Yeah. I did that in quotations because this is audio. That threw me off at the beginning. I just, I yeah. felt like that was throwaway and wasn't needed for the story. Well, I, I will say like a lot of these, so in this particular era, when you're talking about like, uh, you know, mid seventies through like, you know, mid eight, mid to late eighties, there was a, a huge bonus to making a horror movie that you could play on like the 42nd street circuit like where they played all the sleazy exploitation stuff and like a lot of these horror movies knew that if they could get like some like some sort of sexual like you were mm. just saying in there to make it a little more edgy a little more like palatable for the crew that would come hang out at these theaters down on 42nd street and wherever else in new york where you know the sleazy stuff went on and when sleazy stuff went on there and if word um you know, if uh, word of mouth had caught on, like people would come see this movie. So there's a lot of movies, you know, horror movies specifically within that kind of era that just kind of do that. And that's kind of the point because we'll eventually get to Silent Night, Deadly Night. And that was the thing that was also playing in that era of, um, yep. of horror movies. But yeah, that, that's my uh, educated guess of why. Well, that's uh, a very good educated so, guess. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Right. Distribution. Right. If I can yeah. get my my film in more places, I can make money because because right? those theaters were hot back then. I mean, yeah. that was their, you know, that was that was easy money. People were making movies for next to nothing and, you know, quadrupling what they made over and over again. So absolutely. And it's what we want to see. Right. Like we got to remember our human brains do enjoy to some point, which is why we have the existence of pornography. Right. It's is we like to see this stuff. But back to the Christmas, ever, I guess. Ever since we've been able to hold a camera, we've had that. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We should do another episode on that. Um, that'd be an interesting uh, Friday Nightmares. <laughs> um, just just looking at that. No, looking at the sex exploitation yeah, in horror the, yeah. films. Right. Oh, mm -hmm. Like it's yeah. it's definitely not porn. We could do that, too. But like oh, yeah. it's still the the same um, horror porn. So we can find all those on Pornhub. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or other places um but i really did feel like they did represent christmas well the christmas trees him being a toy maker i thought was right. really yep. you know and being so much like oh the children and the children and you think he's going to be this creep and he really isn't he's just this man that really believes in this christmas spirit right. and other people kind of put him down and are not kind to him and yeah, like even his older or his younger brother like yeah. yes. just like so sick resentful. of how he's acting and resentful yeah right yeah, I I really, I just that opening scene, I felt like, it, which what you're saying makes sense. It just in time to the rest, like that opening scene could have been completely changed and it wouldn't change right. the rest it of the story for the me, yeah. right? Like he he was just really passionate about Santa and kind of almost felt like the Christmas spirit had been lost. This yeah. was almost mm -hmm. a movie of like losing the Christmas spirit, but no, you didn't. I'm going to hack all you motherfuckers up. And I'm going <laughs> to yeah. paint my van with a sled on it. Yeah. Um, 
really, really, you brought, you bought into Harry. I really think he did a really good job of just good. kind of being this sweet man who believed in Christmas and everything was Christmas. Like there were Christmas decorations everywhere. It yeah, was... like his whole house was decked out Christmas. And I bet, and I don't think it was just for the Christmas time. I bet his house is decked out like that all year round. Right. Yeah, maybe. Right? Well, because the, the first scene you see him is him at home on Thanksgiving Day. So this movie yes. essentially takes place from Thanksgiving Day all the way to Christmas. Yeah, it covers about a month, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, which is really, which is really interesting. And what I really appreciate about this movie is it was very dialogue heavy, and I felt like I really got to know Harry. I really got to understand his brother's frustration with him, the the kids liking him, and that showdown. I agree with you, Sander. Between the kids with Santa, and I never thought the kids were at risk. No, I didn't no. think he, he never, was ever going to hurt them. them. And but they the adults, that from the beginning, like because he right? cares. You think he's genuinely cares. Right. It, but the adult, so you could tell he was just done with. And that fucking dick at the factor, <laughs> a factory that gets him to work for him oh, and yeah. he's in the oh, bar yeah. making fun of him. What an asshole. Yeah. Everybody um, at that factory was an asshole, though. They were, right? That's what drives his hate, question mark? Uh-oh. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Or, or anger. I just felt like this could have been you take out the gore. And you take out, like, obviously murder and shit. I'm like, this could have been a fucking Christmas story. Like, this yeah. could have been, like, remembering the true meaning of Christmas. Well, depending on what you believe. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you chose this one, Scott. Like, I really yeah, do think sure. it represented Kudos. Christmas. Yeah, because this is the one, because, um, yeah, I had watched this. Once again, this was one that I was introduced to when I was on the horror drunks, because we did this for our Christmas episode, and Randall had chosen it. And I watched it back then and went, holy crap this is really just a really good movie like and it is like it does represent christmas and like it had been a couple years and i'd rewatched it and i remember enjoying it and i think it's about five years since the last time i had seen it rewatched it again it is a bit slow i want to give everybody a warning there it is a very yeah, slow but that's the 80s yeah i would say it's slow paced and there's film. but there's a reason for it for this film mm-hmm. yeah I, I feel like you do you get a you get a few little hints on this character that are like okay this guy what's up here i think they keep you interested just enough yeah. to be willing to sit through it all yeah because it's like it's it's purposely just slow because it's uh all about character development with harry and just watching what he goes through and giving you an understanding of what he who he is as a character and like just pretty much watching his descent into mental breakdown yeah and but yeah i completely agree with you guys like he would not harm a ch- not a single living child he would put them on naughty list but he wouldn't do anything he would just not get them a gift right like, yeah and and but like it does give you that creep factor though in the beginning because you are seeing him just kind of like creepily watching kids with binoculars through like on his balcony, <laughs> just like right. watching them in their home, and you're going, "What well, the fuck?" Like, you're like, a like, hey, you're a good girl. You're a good girl, Elizabeth Moss, yeah. looking at penthouse. But sick. we're also watching it with 2020 eyes, right? Yes. right? I think if we were watching this back in the 80s, we wouldn't have even gone there, or maybe we would have. I don't know. I wasn't old yeah. enough in the 80s to really comment. I was even born 1980. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I think it's, it, it, yeah, but it does come across as he's like borderline creepy and you realize he's not but yeah it was it was uh, i was i didn't understand it at first when i first started watching it and as we went through it i was like okay i get why scott chose this yes it is not a typical slasher i don't i think we should remove like i think they should remove slasher because i don't think this is a slasher Um, not at all like uh and even the cover is very uh like the cover to it is kind of misleading in a way yeah it is actually it is because it almost reminds me of what our next movie is yeah. more than mm-hmm. what that movie <laughs> itself was. Mm-hmm. Oh, and the, the last thing I will say about Christmas Evil is um, the, the music also follows the weird moments within the movie. So like yes. they do this really cool thing where like you have Christmas music, right? And you have the, the, the iconic notes of, you know, I can't remember, like Santa Claus is coming to town or whatever. And then they'll go to like a little heavier, darker scene. And it's the same notes from that song but they like drop it down a key. So it's like very doom sounding. Yes. Um, which was really cool touch. I, I thought that was a really great touch. So. Yeah. And the, and the song was Santa's watching. Santa's. Yeah. yeah. That's what it was. They played it over and over again. It got stuck in my head the rest of the day after I'd watch it that day. <laughs> Scott's <laughs> walking around the office. Santa's watching. Santa's waiting. 
<laughs> but yeah, I'm glad you guys dug this movie because yep, yeah, we watched it. I'm still it's still like uh, right up there as a good Christmas horror film. Uh, so we can jump into the next one, and um, I'm, I'm sure Xander has seen this one. <laughs> um, but this is Silent Night, Deadly Night from 1984. It is a 1984 American slasher film directed by Charles E. Sellier Jr. and starring Robert Brian Wilson, Lillian Chauvin, Gilmer McCormick, Tony Nero, Linnea Quigley, Britt Leach, and Leo Gator. The film was released by TriStar Pictures on November 9th, 1984, where it received st substantial controversy over its promotional material and content, which featured a killer Santa Claus. In addition to receiving negative reviews, it was pulled from theaters a week after its release. However, it was such a success during its opening week, it ended up grossing $2.5 million on a budget of $750,000. Uh, since its release, it has developed a cult following and spawned a series consisting of four sequels with the fourth and fifth installments having no connection to the original film, as well as a loose remake in 2012. The story concerns a young man named Billy who suffers from post-traumatic stress over witnessing his parents murdered on Christmas Eve by a man disguised as Santa Claus and his subsequent upbringing in an abusive Catholic or orphanage. In adulthood, the Christmas holiday leads him into a psychological breakdown and he emerges as a spree killer donning a Santa suit. So um, since Heather, is the, this is a first time watch for you. I want to get your thoughts. Yeah, um... I was sad through 90% of this film. <laughs> I, um, yeah, yeah, honestly, I, I had saved it to this year. This was my first um, time. Congratulations. <laughs> thanks, guys. I was really <laughs> nervous, but, you know, I made it work. Um, wow. I, the opening scene, or the opening, I shouldn't say the opening scene. It's the like opening, opening 10 minutes. minutes. Yeah, yeah. Like 10, yeah. It really gets to you. Um, yeah. I, I, the only beef I had was with the... Uh, the killer, the guy, like he went from robbing a store to committing homicide and almost rape. In I, I just felt like that was a very dramatic step to take. Well, he killed uh, the guy in the convenience store too. Yeah, and I didn't think that was necessary either. Like he was yeah. just going in to rob him, and I just think that he probably would have got the money and fled, um, or run away when the gun was there. Like it just seemed a little dramatic to me. But you know what? You need that for the story, so I can forgive yeah. it. Like it really isn't that big of a deal. I do think the family atmosphere is great. The meeting with the gra creepy grandfather as <laughs> creepy as fuck, right? <laughs> um, and I don't know what his ailment was, uh, but it was, it was just catatonic. From what it was just I, catatonic. Like, was just I, I catatonic. do have to bring up in that scene. What a wonderful father! Uh, father, though they go to visit grandpa. They, you know, end up leaving poor Billy alone with the catatonic <laughs> grandfather. No, right. And he hasn't spoken years. You'll be fine. Son. Yeah, just, yeah. just stay here. We'll be right back. We got to sign some paperwork. They come back and they're going, okay, it was nice visiting you, grandpa. They were there for like 10 minutes. They're like, oh, see you later. We just drove hours well, here to see you. I did. It was right. like a four hour drive to be there for 10 minutes. <laughs> to sign some paperwork in the 1984s. Well, they didn't have faxes then, I guess. Right. They weren't working as well. You couldn't email. But like, of course, his grandfather doesn't turn to him. He's like, oh, Billy, how are you? He's like, you're going to die. <laughs> 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 um, but I felt like that opening scene really did set the tone. And when he's in the orphanage, oh my God, the, the little kid that they had play him looked like he was going to be an asshole, mm -hmm. but he wasn't. Right. He was like the sweetest he's child. He was broken. Yeah. yeah. And, and when he, and of course, now that makes sense when you talked about that couple having sex, I'm like, who are they? Like, is she a nun that works there? And she's just, like, <laughs> forsaken her vows now and is banging this yeah. dude? Like, who are these people having sex in the, like, the convent or the orphanage? Um, but now, we, what you discussed earlier, that makes a lot of sense. It would have got the film to play in different areas, right? Yep. Yeah. And there um, is a lot of uh, sleaze sex style stuff in this film. This, yeah, it's very sleazy. Absolutely. And I guess, you know, you look at sin, right? Like mm -hmm. there is also that, you know, naughty. sin, naughty. Um, and then like this fucking bitch makes him sit on Santa Claus lap. Yeah. What person yeah. would Fuck take her. She, she sucks. Mother after, Superior, go to hell. Yeah. yeah. Mother Superior, after she knows exactly what happened to Billy's parents, like, this is a good idea. <laughs> and it's you can still tell. One. This is so long ago because that shit never would fly in 2020 ever, right? Like it's just, or I don't think it would have flown in the flew in the 90s either. But it was, <laughs> it was a great tie-in to kind of just reinforce. So I thought, and he's also really grateful when he gets his Christmas present. You know, this kid gets locked up in his bedroom, 
and he comes down and they each get one Christmas present and like he's the sweetest little kid and what I really appreciate about this film and I feel like Sleepaway Camp did this well too there may be an antagonist it's an antagonist but you don't really feel like they're an antagonist because you're kind of yeah. you get it yeah you're everything like, you know that they've what? been through yeah, I'd be probably you. fucked up too. So I think there's like a was it a four four year gap between the incident on the road and before he's at the or- so he's at the orphanage yeah. for roughly four years, and I think they really sell the idea that he's been kind of isolated. Like he doesn't yep. talk. He's not like the other kids. But he's not a bad kid. He just doesn't do no. what they want him to do. So your heart really kind of breaks for him because like yeah. It it's sucks. like she wants him to be normal, and there's a there's a kind of a throwaway line where the one sister says to the mother superior, "You know he's just bad around Christmas time." Like obviously, right. because of the trauma he experienced, right? And she's like, "He will sit on Santa Claus's lap." I'm like, "You watch, she, she would be fine, <laughs> right? My ways will work." <laughs> um, <clears throat> the one scene I did laugh out loud at is when you know, I guess it's like 15 years later or 10 years later, whatever. She goes yeah, to the years. store to get him a job right um one of the sisters a sister that he seems to get along with and he's like oh i don't want anyone i need someone super strong and then like billy comes in the scene and billy's been hitting the fucking gym and you know eating his protein and shit because he's fucking ripped yeah he's he's, he's, <laughs> blonde, he's, he's all of a sudden blonde hair and blue eyes right, right he's like super smoking hot i'm like <laughs> and, where did and they before get before he had like red hair and freckles when <laughs> right. he was and, the, and it's funny because <laughs> they even uh like she was even he was like I don't need no 16 year old boy here. And then Billy comes out and you're going, that boy is not 16. <laughs> no, I, or I think she said 18. Did she say well, 18? No, he's, he turns eight. He's 18. About by the time oh, everything okay. Happens. Yeah. Okay. Um, like, like they have the montage of him working away and the music in the background and <laughs> he's drinking milk. Like they offer him booze and he's like, no, no, I got my milk. <laughs> like it's just, I thought that was really cute. I'll be honest. That endeared me to him even more. <laughs> Like, you just feel yeah. so bad for this kid, and you're like, okay, finally, he's somewhere where he can, like, make friends, and he's making friends with that girl, and you can tell he likes her, but he's so fucked up from what he, Mother Superior told him about sex right. that, um, and then, you know, it changes. He snaps, and he, they get him to become Santa. Yeah, I was gonna say, they force right? him to wear a fucking Santa suit, and just instant trauma right there <laughs> and i can't remember what was the incident that pushed him over was it watching her be sexually assaulted yes by the shitty dude yeah. in the back room that was yeah that's what made him because it they do a flashback scene of of what had happened when he was right. a child yeah watching yeah. what happened to his mother i just wasn't so sure if i missed something else no he's imagining santa on top of his mother right when he's on top of the other girl so that's what that's the snap and he just like at first you think she, he's just gonna fucking off the dude and you're like, fuck yeah, right? Like, and then you realize that's not the case. <laughs> no, well, she starts freaking out and like yes. saying, like, how dare you? And just like, and like, just kind of like, just trying to shame him for doing protecting her. Yeah. Well, I think she was shocked that, she, in all fairness, yeah. he just murdered someone right. in front of her. Right, I would but, probably oops. be upset too. I, I think I would probably just win, like, thank you. Oh, shit. I, I'm <laughs> so, going to just leave now. Oh, uh, yeah. Did you, I think did you guys, her reaction was more re- re- reality of how someone would probably Do you know be. if you guys watched a version that had all the scenes edited back in that was yep. cut previously? Okay. Yeah, because you can pretty... tell like, it has like a VHS yes. look when they yeah. added them back in. Because this movie has like one of the most iconic kills in like slasher history. Um, mm-hmm. Antlers. And it, oh, and the it's, antler it's, kill, yeah. And it's fantastic. And part of that scene was cut out from the first, uh, you know, the original release. Like uh, that was much more gruesome with these versions that um, Anchor Bay released a dual DVD set uh, with Silent, uh, Silent Light, Deadly Night, and Silent Deadly Light 2. And then the Scream Factory release that just recently came out like a year or so ago has it all edited back in and polished back up. So yep, uh, I highly recommend seeking those. If you want DVD, seek out the Anchor Bay version. Uh, or Blu-ray, definitely check out on yeah, Scream or, or the Blue, yeah. So if you want to see it, that, that to me, those are the ones you have to watch. Yeah, because I think you watched this on Plex, Heather? I did, yes. Yep, so you get to see the exact same thing because you yeah. and I watched the both same one. Um and and yeah, like his his downfall, you know, the kills are great. I I I did enjoy how okay, my favorite scene um is when they're driving to the orphanage and the cop shot Santa, but it was the oh, wrong yeah. Santa. It was the and father. Like, Why didn't he <laughs> say anything? Death. The father is deaf that. and mute. Like I thought that was the fa- or no, he was just deaf, so he couldn't hear yep. them calling out his name. I thought that yeah. was the best throw in line to like the, justify the shooting. So in this movie, there's no like, like there's no holding back on like 
calling out special needs because they say that about him. And then also the school of children is the school of retarded children. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 1984 at its finest, right? Yeah. Um, and the cops, right? and I did, I did like that scene you were talking about, Heather, where they shot the other Santa. Like, the dude, like they're like, all right, let's traumatize some more children and shoot <laughs> Santa in front of all these kids. <laughs> it's like, oh my kids, gosh. watch this. <laughs> right? Wild. Um, and no. I, of course, when he shows up where the antler kill is at the house and the and the two are having right. sex on the billiard table. And the whole time watching that, I used to play a lot of billiards or pool or whatever. And I was like, that would be so uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, it looks hot. That wouldn't be hot. You'd be, like, scratchy and you'd be like... Yeah, you'd be getting <laughs> burns it, it, all over that felt carpet, uh, felt material. <laughs> it feels hot, but it doesn't feel hot. Like, yeah, that's right. Like, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but it definitely gives a Christmas vibe, like hands Absolutely. down. And the sled scene, I finally saw the sled scene. Um, <laughs> I just feel like this movie had some awesome kills and scenes put in that were so Christmassy. And of course, he's wearing like a Santa suit and mm -hmm. the whole, you know, mall or store thing. Like it was just really good. I don't know what else you guys want to add. I've said all uh, I like, No, like I agree with everything. Like, you know, it's great. Uh, it's, you know, it's sleazy and that it, which is like this is like the first sleazy christmas movie i ever saw yeah like, i was like whoa what the fuck <laughs> uh but it's great it holds up still um i actually like most of the sequels uh second one i don't care for as much but then three well, four and five are good in my I, I opinion like the, own, i like the half ways. hour of new footage you get from part two right <laughs> garbage day it's just so stupid and dumb <laughs> yeah, but it's yeah. just oh my god it's such but, bad acting absolutely oh my god. But yeah like and this is required i think this is required like holiday viewing if you haven't seen it like it just really is and i mean even if you don't like it i think it it, it holds a placeholder in uh holiday horror yes so. absolutely because um and the one thing i got i we didn't really i mean we talked about it but i just gotta say i think it's just really unique that you kind of watch Billy as a child growing up and just the continuous trauma that he's put through but like right. you don't see that in a lot of horror films watching like a child become an adult and I think that was kind of a really neat take for especially the slash because it does not feel like a slasher for like the first half of the film and then the last half of the film kicks in and you're going all right this is where it becomes like the full-blown slasher film yep found it yep and it's just Yep, fantastic. And yeah, like I agree. It covers Christmas darkly, but it covers Christmas <laughs> and has a Christmas representation to it. Um, but speaking of representation of Christmas, let's jump into Xander's pick and see uh, what we have th thoughts on this one. Um, uh, yeah. So we'll do the, uh, I'll try to read this and see if I can pronounce everybody's names without butchering them. <laughs> so we got. The movie is El Dia de la Bestia from 1995, also known as The Day of the Beast. It is a 95 Spanish black comedy horror film co-written and directed by Alex de la Iglesia, starring Alex Angulo, Armando de Raza, and Santiago Segura. Both Mario Grazia Cusinota and El Gran Wyoming have small roles in the film as well. The film was re well received by critics and audiences in its country and sparked interest in De La Iglesia's filmography and style of directing. Uh, a brief synopsis that I could find online because like it's very, very short, but yeah. a heavy metal fan and a psychic help a priest seek the infant antichrist in Madrid, in Madrid at Christmas Day. Oh boy. Um, oh boy. So, we had some issues with this one because uh, Heather was not <laughs> able to find a copy that actually had subtitles. No. She got to visually watch it, and yeah. I think but that I might have been But I learned enough. Italian. Yeah. <laughs> I'm fluent now. Yeah, so I'm... Uh, Xander, this was your pick, so I... Absolutely. I uh, see what your thoughts. Full disclosure, Alex de la Iglesia is one of my favorite directors of all time. This dude is a incredible filmmaker. Uh, he's in all of his quirks are in this and they get better when you get into his later films. He directed um, The Last Circus, uh, The Bar, uh, Witching and Bitching. Uh, he has this really Oh, cool... that was his film? Yeah, those are all his films. Oh, I love that movie. Yeah, so those are all his films. Uh, and he has this like really great ability to like insert like odd humor at the most like uh, inconvenient times, right? Uh, but he also has a great eye for the camera and whatnot. But this film is 
<clears throat> is basically a priest finds out, he deciphers a code and he realizes that the devil or the beast, which is also the devil, is going to come up on Christmas Eve. And he's trying to convince people around him that I need your help to find out where he's going to spawn so we can kill him. And the priest is like, the only way I can make this happen is if I like accept evil. So this God-fearing man decides to be evil and basically be an asshole the whole movie and hurt people and stab people and steal things and refuse to pay. Like just be like kind of a shitty person, but the way he does it, he's like so meek and like he's the meek mannered like priest that you would expect. Like he's very soft spoken. He's like, yeah, he's oh, no. so he's just trying so hard to sin. He's like, I'm not going to pay for that. <laughs> like okay and he bef he befriends like this uh really i love this relation the relationships in this movie to me are fantastic he like befriends a dude in a metal shop yes and like they get this idea that music is going to like summon the beast and summon satan so he's looking for like records and to play them backwards so they can help summon satan so that he can kill satan and save the world and it's like this weird quirky friendship and how they chase it. And like it, the, the, the priest is so genuine about like, oh, I got to do this shitty thing, save the world. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's very comical, but then it, it's slow going and building, mm -hmm. but it's, he keeps you constantly interested. This film doesn't particularly scream Christmas at all. Uh, with <laughs> no. the exception of one scene and it happens on Christmas Eve and Christmas day. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Cause I think the one scene that I can remember was, uh, when they run through someone else's apartment and the little girl is thinking that that, that it's Santa Claus and they're right. wa she's watching the, like a commercial on TV with Santa in it. Yeah. So yeah, so this the whole movie just uh, plays out. One of the out. stores has Christmas decorations in the window. When you don't understand what's going on, there's no subtitles, you really pay attention <laughs> to the background. And I would like to mention there was some excellent Christmas decorating that occurred in this film. Yeah. So it, Okay, it, I didn't it, notice that. Yeah, so you just- That's because you were too busy reading the subtitles. <laughs> So true you could do both heather it's not that far um, <laughs> did you yeah, notice you... the christmas decoration sander no oh, i did <laughs> um, so it's just this like it's this is kind of a loof group of people and they eventually like befriend like a tv psychic that is full of shit and which is then, awesome that's an awesome then, scene <laughs> and then he realizes oh shit this crazy priest might actually be talking about something and they you know they wind up doing acid with virgin blood and <laughs> yes. like it gets so fucking weird but it stays funny. Uh, it's highly entertaining, and I cannot like praise this movie enough. I, I, Alex de la Iglesia to me is a fucking genius, um, and I, I I would I can't wait to hear what Old Smoke Show thinks here and get Heather's interpretation without words. Uh, it, but I will say it doesn't feel all that Christmassy, and it kind of is a little horror light, even though it picks up stronger in the end. Uh, it's more of a, like a, a just a weird story black comedy that has eventually gets to horror, but that's only in the last like fifteen. But yeah. great film. Um, Heather, do you want to go next, or do you want me to go next? Um, you go. I'll right. save the best for last. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, I'm pretty much right there with you, Xander. This, I, especially the relationship between the metal metal dude so and great. the priest. It's. <laughs> Like they build such a good like bond friendship. with each other yeah. in chemistry. The friendship is there. Um, like you even get to like just chill there, like when he's chilling with his mother and uh, his <laughs> naked grandfather is just walking yeah. around the house all the time. <laughs> like you see his, you see him give his naked grandfather, like uh, the metalhead acid. dude, uh, give his naked grandfather acid just because he's just old and doesn't care anymore. And <laughs> he's like, it helps him get through the day. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um it's like just some of the like this is the part that saddens me that heather couldn't watch it with subtitles because the dialogue is freaking hilarious in it's some of awesome. these scenes but man it is such a bizarre film like i i didn't realize that i forgot iglesia did uh witching and bitching because that movie was just so Top entertaining notch. and so yeah. makes sense now like thinking i'm mm -hmm. like oh yeah these movies are perfect together right um but yeah that's <laughs> i just had a blast with this though it was frustrating i will have to admit trying to watch it on Tubi because unfortunately my roommate was downloading something the entire time while he was gone and it sucked up my internet. So the hour Slow and 40 guy. minute movie took me about two hours and 20 minutes to get through. Ooh. Yeah. Cause it just kept buffering and just like, I was what like, was all right, he I'm downloading. He was a uh, cyberpunk. Oh, okay. Uh, so, massive game. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And uh, 
yeah, like it was just sucking up the internet. But man, that it it was a chore because especially the commercials just like took yeah. forever to get through, like on to because of that. But you know, that can't say that's not against the film because the film mm-hmm. had some slow parts, but at the same time kept you invested. Um, and like, each character they introduced was entertaining and unique in their own right. right. And you when you get all three, the psychic, the metalhead, and the priest together, like. It's just the yeah. comedy from that is great, and like their interactions between each other. The and casting always, the casting is always great in his films. Like yeah. the characters that he, the actors that he puts in place are next level, which is one of the reasons why he's one of my favorite. Like I literally, absolutely, I will watch anything this guy ever makes, hands down. Yeah, I am. I'm going to be looking back some, for some of his other filmography now, like that I have not oh, yeah. seen. Yeah, um, the bar is on Netflix, and the Last Circus is—I don't know where it is now. It was. Yeah, I have seen the Last Circus too because I completely forgot. That's why I watched Witching and Bitching because I seen Last Circus yeah. and I found out. Oh, this guy did that. Okay, same guy. Yeah. So I, okay, so I've seen three of his movies now. Yeah, yeah he's got me many more. He's got many more. <laughs> um, but yeah, then I do love that third act where the the horror does start to ramp up, and you get like the uh, silly looking uh, CGI. <laughs> goat demon walking around at the yeah. end and <laughs> basically black philip in circa 1995 yeah but if, I remember, awesome. if i'm remembering correctly it had like a flopping penis too oh <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah it, this was just a all-around fun film yeah it mentions christmas eve and christmas day yeah, and like you see just, some and some christmas decorations, decorations. yeah i say in some christmas decorations it definitely is the probably the when it comes to the Christmas feeling, least Christmas the least Christmas feeling, which one is strange of all of our be, films. Because as soon as it starts off, like the thing says on Christmas Eve, blah blah blah, like yeah. it starts off immediately. Like, oh, we're gonna be like Christmas heaven, and it's like, no, not at all. Yep, exactly. <laughs> but like yeah, this this film though is I recommend it. It's just it was a lot of fun and it was highly entertaining. <laughs> and uh, now I want to get Heather's uh, visual interpretation of the film. <laughs> Well, first of all, this is a very much a Christmas film, and I think you're wrong. Because this is about Christ, the Antichrist, and the Jesus is the reason for the season. Fair enough. Valid point. So, you know what? Santa is not always Christmas, guys. <laughs> a fair point. I actually like this movie. I liked it more than Castle Freak, and I <laughs> it was in a different language, um, because I thought even even with watching it, and not verbally understanding it. What I what I did go back and do is I read the Wikipedia pot summary. Okay. And that helped a lot because I was able to look back to scenes in like I have a pretty good memory that if I watch something and I read something afterwards, I can try to match it up. And I'm like, this would have been funny with the subtitles because it's hilarious. <laughs> there was it's parts really I even hilarious. laughed without knowing what was going on because there was just funny shit that was happening on the screen. <laughs> like, the, yeah. like the drugs and the grandfather and like the, the, the goat, like there was just shit that was funny that you didn't need the translation or even the TV psychic and his like stupid commercial. Like, and that's great filmmaking. Exactly. And that shows you what you can do with the language barrier, right? That I could still read expressions. I could still understand what, you know i didn't get the full plot obviously um and but when i read it i could look back and go oh okay that's what that meant okay that's what they meant that's what they were doing um so is this christmas like done up like what we expect in north american christmas no but maybe this is representative of what christmas is like in other parts of the world maybe they don't over dress up shit this everywhere very true yeah, and maybe that's how it is is and really when you're talking about you know depending what you believe um, Christmas was, was supposed to be the birth of Christ. So if we're looking at the birth of the Antichrist, that's pretty connective to it. So I hope to one day find the subtitled version in Canada. Because, it is available on Blu-ray. So so I could buy it. I don't know if I'm oh, that God. in love with it. Or we could um, see if our good, uh, our good friend could get it on his Plex for you. If someone owns it and could upload it for me on their Plex, that would yeah. be great. Yeah. So I could watch it. Um, or you could just buy it and support it, Heather. I don't see the fucking problem here. I know. I'm sorry, Sander. I'm um, I'm a bad person. <laughs> and I'm gonna, Roxy, I'm gonna you actually, pissed off Roxy. She I know. Roxy's like, <laughs> I'm not down with this illegal shit. <laughs> and actually, Heather, I recommend if you can do it, also find Witching and Bitching and Last Circus. Look, I'm going to have are... to buy all this shit now so Sander doesn't judge me. I'm going to be like. <laughs> the bar is on Netflix. Yep. <laughs> oh, hopefully no, it's on canadian go. netflix hopefully it's on eh, probably fucking not who knows 
who knows, right? We don't get all the movies. I, I get it. You guys don't deserve Alex de la Iglesias. It's fun. <laughs> that's true. We haven't earned it yet. Really, that's what this comes down to. We haven't earned it yet. But I can comment on the filmmaking. It was excellent. You yeah, can tell that this director knows what they're doing. I would, if I ever was to teach a course at any university, like I would teach it about him probably. <laughs> yeah. That'd be and awesome. there's a reason why. Yeah. You know, so uh, I think if you like black comedies, I think if you are more of like religious, I think you may find this funny because it maybe, and maybe if you would say, hey, yeah, this is how Christmas is in other parts of the world. It's just North America where you guys, you know, put tinsel on everything. <laughs> right. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that's just an us thing. So, but I enjoyed it. So thank you for bringing something different, Sander. Uh, to You're very the table. welcome. Yeah. Thank uh, you. For this I, one. I, I hopped at the chance to bring my favorite director on. Like I, I didn't, I knew this was a movie of his, but I wasn't aware that it had any sort of Christmas like reference. So when I was digging, I was like, ah, I don't want to pick anything. So I was like digging hard. I was like, Oh fuck, this one is, are you kidding me? So, you've definitely yeah, expanded our audience's like knowledge i feel I like so that's what next i was episode, like, I you're listen, not gonna you be on show. well listen to you guys show and i know what you guys talk about and i was like oh man I, I really like i really genuinely tried to bring different things today that uh would like you know open everybody's um viewing habits you, you really out. have and you and, came with the knowledge like i don't know scott's and i are going to be like in january uh, like, so I really like this movie. You, you say that good. now until on the Facebook group, they're like, what are you fucking tell Xander to shut the fuck up? <laughs> <laughs> Who does that guy think he is? What is this Academy Award critique? <laughs> oh. uh, though no, I do I have to so. say, this will show you how much research that goes into the Friday Nightmares podcast when <laughs> all of a sudden we're talking about Alex D. Iglesias and I had no freaking clue that I had watched two of his other movies before because that's how much research I did. That's how prepped I am. Well, you know, this was our Christmas. We were just taking it easy, Xander. We to, knew you to, were coming to be, on. To be fair, I, any other director, I probably wouldn't have known, but like, like, you know, you have your guys, right? This is one of my faves. So like, right. Well, and the sad thing is, when I was writing out all the like the information on uh, on paper, I'm like, Iglesias, that sounds familiar. Like, Alex Dale Iglesias, that sounds familiar. Just I I could have easily went to IMDb. My ass just was being lazy, you, and I didn't. You're too busy <laughs> with your OnlyFans and all your ladies. True. <laughs> like Scott, we all know what you're doing, and your Gremlins calendar. So like yes. you're just too. You got too hey, we all love on. the Gremlins calendar. Let's not. Right? We all love the Gremlins calendar. Well, I'm glad everyone Every else day, does. Every day, what's going to come out of the calendar? I don't know, but next year, somebody's got to find a fucking Critters one to give them. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yes, that'd be amazing. Oh. <laughs> so for all of the women out there that are competing for Scott's affection, uh, listening to our show, <laughs> um, can you... <laughs> and make a Critters advent calendar for him next year, and you will win his heart forever. Yes. And there you go. It's like The Bachelor, and I can be that friend that consults him at the end that comes on. And is like... It's not a rose. <laughs> he hands out a crate at the end of the Yes. <laughs> Here's your crate. Yes. Oh my God. That'd be amazing. <laughs> uh, so uh, we could just uh, jump on to our final hey, film yeah. of the evening for our main topic. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not our final film. Wait. Yeah, it is. No. Better watch out. And oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. You fucker. I missed just one. <laughs> Look, I know you're trying to rush through this, Scott, but. Don't worry, we'll make not it trying quick. to rush that much. I completely slipped my mind. Um, but all right, the next film on our uh, episode is going to be, I don't know. I don't think anyone has heard of this movie at all. Um, but it's this little known title known as Krampus from 2015. The good Krampus. What, not Mrs. Claus or Krampus Claus or whatever those <laughs> like, are out there? The now? Return of Krampus. The Revenge of Krampus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but uh, Krampus is a 2015 American Christmas comedy horror film based on the eponymous character from Austro-Bavarian folklore, written and directed by good old Michael Doherty, known for Trick or Treat, and co-written by Todd Casey and Zach Shields. The film stars Adam Scott, Tony Collette, David Kushner, Allison Tolman, Conchetta Farrell, MJ Anthony, Stefania Levy, Owen, Lola Owen, Queenie Samuel, Maverick Flack, Sage Hoonfield, and Krista Stadler. Woo, that was a lot of names. Uh, you did it. In the film, a dysfunctional family squabbling causes a young boy to lose his festive spirit. Doing so unleashes the wrath of Krampus, a fearsome <laughs> horned demonic beast in ancient European folklore 
who punishes naughty children at Christmas time. As, Chris, as Krampus lays siege to the neighborhood, the family must band together to save one another from a monstrous fate. Krampus was released in the U.S. on December 4th of 2015 by Universal Pictures. It received mixed to positive reviews with many critics praising Scott and Colette's performances, the horror elements and humor, while its tone, pacing, and final twist ending received criticism. The film had grossed over $61 million against a $15 million budget. All right, so this one is kind of like Michael Doherty. It did with, uh, for like halloween feeling films with trick-or-treat i personally think he nailed this as a christmas film like um and since xander is our guest i will pass it on to you and get your opinions on krampus yeah so i think you're 100 percent right with already nailing down uh christmas and the reason i say that is because like so the things you think of uh on christmas are cold snow right you think of you think of family uh, you think of eating and you think of gift giving, right? And, and all these things are very strong in this particular film. Um, I absolutely adore Toni Collette, like one of my favorite actresses of all time. No matter what she does, I will see it. I love that she's been dabbling her feet into horror the last yes. few years and being able to go from horror back to other big uh, movies and all of that. Like Hollywood is respecting the fact that she can bounce back and forth. She's amazing actress i will watch anything she's in yes uh, she Adam's... is just phenomenal doesn't any she's movie she's great. in. she's great but the casting as a whole and i would like to say aunt dorothy uh played by uh conchita uh rest in peace passed away oh this yes year. um so you know kudos to her she's wonderful in this movie this, this is filled with great characters from top to bottom even the kids are great uh i love you know it, it just cat captures winter and holiday the whole time um, and I love how it bounces back from being really dark and kind of doomy to being kind of cheesy and almost killer clowns from out of space, killer clowns yes. from out of space kind of humor, right? Like when all the toys come out, you're like, oh, this is super silly, but it's kind of fucking terrifying at the same time. Um, and I just think like he handles all those things so well. Uh, I absolutely love the dark elves are yes. awesome. Like the Krampus uh, version of elves. It's so freaking cool. Yeah, and I love how he paces it at the beginning where you just kind of see like the little shadows of him kind of running around. And there's like, there's all these mysteries of like, oh, the snowman just appeared randomly in the yard. All oh, this bag of gifts just appeared randomly in the front door. And they're like, oh, that's how they introduced the, you know, the Krampus monsters or whatever to get into the house to wreak havoc. Uh, I, I love how it's all pieced together. Um, the film does slow at some point within the movie, but at the end of the day, I think this thing is uh, solid from beginning to end. I think there's not many films that really encompass Christmas as much as this one does. Like to me, of all the ones we watched, this this is the one that screams and yells Christmas all day long throughout the whole movie. Um, and I think at this point, this has honestly become one of the classics. This is a modern day classic, right? Like this is, to me, Krampus is what uh, Halloween is to Halloween. Like it really truly is because it, it it took all the things we had in Christmas movies before and it really just amplified it and made a great film with uh it had a lot of money put into it, which is a huge benefit, which a lot of these Christmas horror movies don't get that. So there's plenty of money put into it, amazing actors and a great director, Michael Doherty. And I think this thing is 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 one of the best Christmas films you could ever Christmas horror films that you could ever watch. Like there's there's not many better than this one. So I completely agree with you. Um, I'm going to toss this to Heather, though, because this was one of her picks, which I'm glad she did. But uh, Heather, your thoughts on Krampus? Well, originally, I wanted to watch this when I was still married, and my ex-husband refused to watch it, and that's what really led to my divorce. Um, <laughs> nice. Was it Krampus or was it Adam Scott? Tell um, me. <laughs> it was definitely Krampus. Um, Adam Scott but. <laughs> this movie also represents the legend of Krampus yes. really, really well. And and I really want to give it props for that. I think Krampus in this is presented in a way that is scary, but almost gives you a lesson. There's a big moral lesson throughout this, right? right? And the grandmother in her role is exceptional. And some even great lines where she's speaking, I believe it's in Hungarian. Is it Hungarian? I think it might be German. Yeah, I think it's German. German. It's German. German. And then she switches to English. And they're like, English, I knew it. I 
<laughs> like there's little lines like that that were thrown in that were just funny. Like yeah. they were, or all right, kids, we're going to make some peppermint snotch. Like just funny shit that she threw in. The dinner table conversation, or even when they come in as a family from the pageant and the opening scenes of showing people at the mall and the fighting really shows how North America has diluted what the quote unquote meaning of Christmas is. Yep. Basically, you know, not to get too deep here, but consumerism and, you know, this, this need to do all these things, right. And, and to have the best and to be the best and the family discussion over the dinner table, like reminded me of very much of home alone. Remember when they all get the pizza and they fight and Kevin gets sent out to his room and it kind of reminded me of a little bit of that only much dire consequences. And yeah, I agree. The slow buildup of the monsters, the slow picking off of the family members, yeah. and the comedy, like the little gingerbread men and the shit. Like, I would love the gingerbread men. And it's the a, dog a, eating the one gingerbread man. Like, you almost wonder if they're going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's why I, I, I kin it to, like, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, because it's so funny and kind of dumb, but you can't help but like it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and they give the illusion, what I really respected about this movie is I thought everything was going to be okay. I really right. thought that somehow this kid's going to have that standoff with Krampus and it's going to... Spoiler alert. You know, well, we do spoil movies. We okay. spoil these that we're watching. So <laughs> we're going to spoil this movie. If you don't know that from listening to our show and welcome, we spoil movies. <laughs> well, um, in that final scene uh, where he basically confronts Krampus and says all those things, I thought that was really well done. Like I really felt for the kid and what he was He's a great to... actor yeah yes. he was excellent everyone was really in this great. movie was an excellent actor and played their role well even you know the children that were kind of obnoxious and stuff they were obnoxious they yeah. were who they were supposed to be obnoxious little assholes and you right. and you bought into that um i was sad that the dog died like oh yeah you don't, well, you don't really it. know no but yeah know. but you kind of like you assume. Get, right um and now here's a question, and this is as we spoil. What do we think they're? Where are they? Um, they are. This is my per, uh, what I perceived it as when I seen this in theaters. Um, I because like when it did the whole, oh, he wakes up and he's going back down to his family, like nothing's happened. I was like, all right, this ending just pissed me off. And then see, I would have like, liked that if he would just learn from a bad dream. Yeah, see, I didn't want like that like full on happy ending. Like, and, like, hate like Christmas. Well, no, I just don't like the fact that like everything would have been for nothing. We watched mm. it go and then just kind of be erased. Well, it seems but, like a cop-out, right? Yeah. It seems like a cop-out in the end. But then when you see it pan out and you see it's like their whole town is in a freaking Christmas globe and they, and when they, and he opens that Krampus. Mouth Isn't it and, just their house? No, it's nope, the but, whole street. Yep. Okay. It's the whole street. And when he opens that bell and you just see everybody register in their brains, like, Oh shit, this really happened. And then they like realize what I'm thinking it happened is they're pretty much in Krampus's version of Purgatory. Pur- they are right, stuck yeah. to relive this moment for the it's rest their, of their for, lives. It's their forever punishment, right? So their forever punishment is to relive Christmas Day and have hot cocoa? No, like the whole event. Be terrorized. Yeah, but, yeah. That's terrorized. Not, but they wake up on Christmas Day. Yes, but so I think after everything that... Everything happened I, leading up to Christmas Day. Yep. So how I are they reliving it? Because I think they realize, like, because I think it's something they are stuck going to be living every Christmas now. I thought they were going to just be stuck there. in the globe, and that's it. I didn't. No, I didn't look that. I just thought they were stuck in a globe, in this I, ideal. Because a globe has an ideal image, right? Like yeah. it always looks snowy and happy and whatever. Because yeah. there's no hint that they'll relive it. Because technically, they, he has the bell now. He's been given the bell, right? Which we heard right. from the grandmother that that was the final thing that would happen with Krampus. I'm not saying you're wrong. I just. I'm just curious too. Yeah, this was just my interpretation. Of course, of yeah, course. Yeah, because I, because I kind of look at it as like they're not going to. Rel- I don't think they're going to relive like the same night over and over again. I think what's going to happen is they are just going to be reliving this type of Christmas where bad shit happens to them, but then they wake up and they're fine again, like on Christmas Day, like Groundhog Day ish. Yeah. See, I yeah, didn't get I, that. I, I thought there was going to be a globe. Sorry. Yeah, uh, for me, I, I feel like it's uh. uh it's like a lesson in like, you know, you didn't learn this lesson soon enough. So now Krampus fucking owns you, like mm. owns you forever. Like, yeah, you finally put it together. But guess what? It was too fucking late. And here yeah. I have you for the rest of your life. I, can, I like that better, actually. Yeah, you're you're within my world now. I 
can do whatever you, you want, but your life is gone. You, you are here with me. And, and like, and like you said, like in, in my purgatory, essentially. Mm. Uh, so that's the way I looked at it was like, yes, you did finally come to see what you needed to see. But at the end of the day, Krampus wanted the whole family to see that, not just him. Yeah. So that's that the way I think. Yeah, that's an interesting, I like that. And I just, I thought it was interesting that the grandmother had lived it, survived. Right. Right. And I just thought it was kind of weird. So she would have been an orphan and like her son would have had no idea that she was raised as an orphan. And uh, also, I, mean, I, uh, I love that uh, stop animation. Yes. I was going to bring that up. Yes. It is brilliant. It is Absolutely. so good. Yeah. Because, um, but yeah, I, I, the thing with the whole orphan thing and uh, her son, maybe, maybe she just kept that quiet because of the yeah. whole Krampus story. Absolutely. Maybe. Um, and also, that generation doesn't necessarily share that kind of stuff, right? Like, right coming from a different generation but christmas wise i i don't think you could have a better christmas movie i remember when i watched this a couple of christmas eves ago and i took my dog out for a walk and it was one of those christmas eves that were, was really cold and i remember being like creeped out as i was walking past a park near my house and the, and the wind was blowing and it was just that bone chilling cold that we can get um up in the northern area and <laughs> Like, I was like, holy fuck, Krampus, it's going to go get me. Like, <laughs> it was really, like, it ingrained in my head, and I think that's really awesome. Yep, I completely agree. Um, so, yeah, my thoughts are pretty much mirroring everybody's, though uh, whenever I tell somebody about this film, I tell them, do you like National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation? <laughs> do you like Gremlins? Do you like Home Alone? Do you like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? Because you are getting a mashup of all these films pushed into one. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Yes, with the grandma retelling of Krampus. That's what that reminded me of. Oh, okay. Um, but the whole fa dysfunctional family dynamic was covered perfectly because this happens yeah. in a lot of American families, like for Christmas, getting together with your family. It's not always the greatest. You always have someone that you'll bump heads with, but you're always trying to play nice and just put that fake smile yeah. on. And uh, you know, that was nailed in Christmas Vacation perfectly, and that's what well, that reminded me of. It, it's nailed here, too, where Adam Scott's telling his son, yes. he's like, oh, we got to be nice to our family because they're our family, and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but <laughs> we have yep. to be nice to our family. <laughs> so. Yeah, I was going to say, I love the family dynamic between, like, the two different families. Like, you have the rich, uh, busy right. lifestyle one of a uh, Adam Scott and Tony Collette and their kids, and then you have the more, uh, like, gun-toting Republican style of right. uh, Adam Kirshner and uh, uh, I can't remember her, the, his wife's name, but like, yeah, you got the two girls that are like dressed up to be boys and just wanting to play yeah. football and be well, tomboys. One of my favorite lines in the movie is when uh, the, not Adam Scott, but the uh, David, whatever the hell is acting. Yeah, David like, Kirshner. Yeah. He's like, your fancy ass neighborhood's getting destroyed to shit. <laughs> 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 oh, but yeah, I just like this, because, like, the first half of this film just feels like a good old, like, just get-together family Christmas movie. Like, well, I'd say the first half hour. And yeah. then it starts, like, getting the dark moments when Krampus shows up. And I have to say, um, for what they did with Krampus, especially the first introduction of him when you see their daughter walking down the street and it's getting darker and darker. And all of a sudden you hear the chains rattling and you see him just standing as a silhouette on the rooftop. That like brought chills down my spine because I'm just going, oh shit. And then when he all of a sudden gets active and starts hopping from house to house to house, hearing that on an amazing sound system, it's, it's rattles. awesome. Yeah, it just <laughs> rattles the walls. Like it's so like thunderous. And yeah, and I think it helps put you like in that space, right? Like immediately yes. when you have that booming sound and you have these beautiful visuals of like, the snow like you're immediately like oh what if i was in the snow we all know what it feels yeah. like to be freezing cold in the snow right and have, if you heard these sounds coming behind you when you were that fucking cold that's terrifying as shit <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and if you know like when you have a huge snowstorm it gets like really silent outside and you right. can hear, hear everything. everything and it's everything's echoey yeah and, like so yeah just that of that like they nailed that and i have to say like, because everything else, I agree with you guys completely 100%. But the one thing that didn't get brought up really is the look of Krampus. Because normally he's like the horned goat faced devil like type creature. And with this, he basically is the antithesis of Santa Claus. 
He's got like a deranged looking Santa Claus face that's all warped and stretched out. Like he's almost wearing a fake Santa Claus mask. And I think like when I first seen that, like I was like completely unsettled. I'm going, holy crap, that is freaking creepy as hell. Like just the way his mouth is just stretched out and you have the giant tongue rolling out and everything. Like I thought the design for Krampus was incredible in this. And like I figured it like fit the representation of a demented version of Santa Claus. Yeah. And for those that are interested, there is a book called The Art of Krampus that has a foreword yes. written by Michael Doherty and the uh, art director does all. And it's fin I have it. It's if you're if you love the visuals in Krampus, that book is a great coffee table book just to have and thumb through. So I would awesome. love to look through that. It's cool as fuck. <laughs> That's really cool. All right. And then as Heather corrected me earlier, now we are on to the last film. <laughs> <laughs> Scott's just excited to be done. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to be a day. We'll just say that much. <laughs> so the, the final film for the night is uh, Better Watch Out from 2016. It is a psychological horror film directed by Chris Peckover and written by Zach Kahn and Peckover. Stars Olivia de Jong, Le- Levi Miller, Ed and Ed Uxenbold. The film had its world premiere at Fantastic Fest on September 22nd, 2016, and was released in the United States on October 6th, 2017 by Wellgo USA and in Australia on November 23rd, 2017 by Rialto Distribution. Uh, The synopsis is, Ashley travels to the suburban home of the learners to babysit their 12-year-old son, Luke, during the holidays. She must soon defend herself and the young boy when unwelcome intruders announce their arrival. So we will be spoiling this film. There, there's no way we, we always can. do all of them. Apparently, all of them. We spoil <laughs> life, actually. Yes. No, I, I try. I, well, I've been, the whole show. I've been like trying myself not to just do it, just out of habit. Like, okay, don't. Oh, we only do. If we do it for our this segment. We always do. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you haven't seen, better watch out because there is a pretty big twist. That a way to call me out, Heather. Sorry. You know. <laughs> Santa I was Clay. making a joke. Sorry, Sander. Sorry, right. Sander. Please keep coming with your knowledge so Scott and I look smarter when we repeat everything you said on this last episode. <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> like it's our own knowledge. <laughs> like, sorry, we had to re record the. Christmas I'll be like, show. did you know in the 80s there was sex and PlayStation? <laughs> <laughs> I just learned this myself and had no help in finding this information. Um, but yeah, we will be spoiling it because there is a pretty big twist that. There is, and this one is significant. Yeah. So okay. this is something on our show that we would question on whether spoiling, because like the twist is kind of important to. Oh, it is. It yeah. is. So if you have not seen Better Watch Out and you don't want it spoiled, then skip ahead. Yeah. Or jump out or pause it, go to Shutter, watch it there, and come back. Does anyone actually do that? Maybe. I used to do that back in the day when I. Uh... Okay. One of the first podcasts I listened to that got me into listening to podcasts was it came from the basement and uh, they would do segments and talk about stuff. And they're like, hey, pause it. I'm like, oh, shit, I'll pause it, watch it. And then I come back like a day later. So, yes, it does happen. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> there's like laying the knowledge down. Loving this. I love it. Scott's like, finally, someone talks back to Heather. Yep. Put her in the <laughs> um, Usually, but- Heather bullies me for three hours. <laughs> That's our podcast. <laughs> it's pretty much true. <laughs> um, but uh, Xander, have you seen this before? Uh, I had seen it before, but honestly, it's been a while, and I, I was confusing parts of this movie with another movie. So oh, okay. it was good to go back and watch. Well, I'll say we might as well uh, just, uh, since you're our guest, we'll just jump on in with you first and uh, get your thoughts on Better Watch Out. Yeah. So if uh, so, what rewatching at this time, I akin it a lot. It had a lot of things in common with The Babysitter, which is a Netflix film. Yes. Um, I think the babysitter is a better film, but that's a different discussion. Um, so this definitely it's, it has like all the things of Christmas, right? Like there's Christmas lights, it's cold, there's Christmas music. Uh, but I, I, the whole movie, I kind of felt like something was kind of missing from it that I couldn't really put my hand on. Uh, but I like the babysitter and this kid is like a good son. This is like a, a, a weird version of the good son too, right? Yes. Like think Macaulay Culkin and the good son, but this this kid's much more like broy and cheesy. Like he's very confident that he's gonna bang this beautiful babysitter. And yeah. <laughs> he's 12 and she's like 18. He's like, I'm gonna I'm gonna fuck her. He's like, No, you're not, dude. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> but he's so like confident. 
Uh, yeah, he's is, got uh, so much confidence, which uh, goes, I gotta say, for the kid actor who played this kid. Fucking bravo! Like he. Yeah, bravo. like I, I don't, I don't know how his parents read this script. It was like, yeah, it's fine. You can say her pussy tastes like cotton candy. It's fine. <laughs> like, it's fine. You can say that on screen. It's fine. Um, so, <laughs> but I think it does like a great job of like switching it on you. Um, so like, like you know, the synopsis says like an intruder comes in, and like, oh shit, the intruder's here. But then there's a revelation of like, oh, this shit was intentional. Yep. This little fucker and his friends set you the fuck up, which like infuriates you, right? <laughs> like, what the fuck is wrong with this kid? He's clearly sadistic. That's why I call him the good son too. Um, but it, I, I don't. There's some really cool moments. Like a boyfriend comes up. Like the the whole paint can the paint can thing was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but at some point, to me, it just becomes really incredibly like just flat out unbelievable. And to me, it kind of lost its. All the charm it had at the beginning seemed to eventually fade for me for whatever reasons. Uh, and that's why I say it's really hard for me to put my finger on it because it had like all the Christmas elements and like the story as a whole was kind of solid, but like there was something missing in there for me. And I think it actually has to do more so with the tone of the film because uh, it stays like bright and cheery and Christmas time. So you have lights, everything's well lit and it's very clean looking. And I feel like this movie had an opportunity to make it like the kid does such a good job of being this like sadistic character. Right. And like, they, I feel like they kind of failed at making it really gritty. Um, yeah. Like it, I felt like it should have been intensified more. Granted it, it did get a couple times there, but I, it, uh, toward the end, it felt like an imitation of, of 10 other films rather than something true to itself. And that really kind of hurt it for me. And that's, I mean, that that's me, you know, I don't know if I'm overthinking it or whatnot, but like, it started off really strong and I liked when they switched it to the kid being like, Oh, this is a fucking setup. But then it slowly just like lost its way. And then I didn't care for the ending either. Uh, it, it just, I don't know. I, it was okay to me. Like I appreciated half the movie and the second half of the movie, I felt like it all kind of went away for me. So what do you guys think? Uh, Heather. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really fair comparison. I think this movie could have taken place at any time. Right, this didn't I, really feel like there wasn't, besides like the house being overly decorated for Christmas in some cases. Yep, and uh, the child wearing an ugly Christmas sweater. Yes, an ugly Christmas sweater. It was all kind of like, hey, it's Christmas. Did you guys yep. know it's Christmas? I'm not sure if you know it's Christmas, but it's Christmas. Yeah, because this um, is literally, because like, that is like literally the best way to like kind of like find out if a movie like has that holiday feel. Could this take place any other day? And this, this could have been, been a July 4th yeah. barbecue. Yeah, it or it could have been, been President's Day and it wouldn't have yeah. made I mean, It could have just been a regular weekday. Yeah. Yeah, it, it just felt more like a home invasion film than a Christmas film, honestly. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I will say I really enjoyed the awkwardness between the babysitter and him. There were parts where I was cringing when he was trying to pick, put the moves on her, and it made yeah. me uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, probably because I had babysat kids that are like that age difference and had them kind of hit on me. <laughs> not, that, not to that extent, but like... You know, it kind of gets a little creepy when you're a young woman with like a young man that probably doesn't need a babysitter at 12. Yeah. Um, right. So anyway, I, I, that was probably more of my own reflection in that scene. Um, but it was, I thought the main character's interactions were good. I thought his friend was funny. Yes. Um, I Very like young version of uh, Jamie Kennedy and Scream. Yes. Right? Like that's the yes. vibe you kind of get from him. Absolutely. And I thought the setup of them playing video games or like talking in his bedroom before she came over was really good. Um, I really agree. The first half of this movie was really strong. Then the twist happens and he's kind of at first you're like, oh, he's just upset that she's rejected him. So she's, he's doing these weird things. But when he kills that one guy and he yeah. lets down the paint can, which is very home alone and he's like, yep. I've always wanted yeah. to try this and was a shout out. I was like, all right, we went from like, I have a crush to I'm a fucking psychopath. And like And no time. And no and no, no hints time. beforehand, no. other than I, the fact he was a teenage a prepubescent boy that had an feelings for his babysitter. Yeah. Right? Like it to me, and then you know, the shit he does with the other boyfriend outside, and then he kills his friend, and he's like, Look what you made me do. Like he does this whole narcissist crazy psychopath shit, and that's where it lost it for me. Right. I felt like that got too much too quickly, just too over the top. 
but otherwise i enjoyed the interaction but yeah this movie was christmas because it was based at christmas not because it you know and it snowed outside yeah (laughs) yeah it was cold (laughs) and i'm pretty much uh right there with you guys like yeah this has like the only reason this has a christmas feel is because of the decorating there's no other reason um but like i and yeah i agree with like that twist for him to go from like just macking on his babysitter to just complete an utter psychotic narcissist. Guess I'm gonna kill everybody. Let the bodies hit the floor. Let the bodies yeah, hit the like, floor. It, it was a, <laughs> it was like a just flipping a switch with him, and that was like you didn't like. And you know, I've, I've watched this movie, I'd say about four times now, like since it's come out, like once a year almost. Um, and like I try to pick up because you know, like try to give you little clues of what's going on, like on your rewatches, you can kind of pick up on things that the kid's doing. Um, but there's still not any signs to show that he's that freaking psycho. Right. And, you know, I have to say it cause I will probably get called out and uh, like by one of our podcasting buddies for, you know, saying I, with the movie, the lodge and saying the stuff that I said about that film um, with this film. I also do not like the fact that this 12 year old boy somehow came up with this elaborate foolproof plan to pull all this shit off mm-hmm. there's and no how long way are the parents at the fucking party for can we just mention right, that no. what is this like a five-day party right yeah. <laughs> but yeah like i cannot even buy that this 12 year old came up with all these elaborate ways of taking out her ex-boyfriends and being able to cover it up like there's no fucking way he could have done that. And no like overconfidently, like yes. never for one second did he, de- no matter what went wrong, not for one second did he think it wasn't going to go his way. Not for right. one second. Yeah. And being able to just like pull everything off and then pull it off in such a way that, you know, he's believed at the end that, you know, intruders actually came into the house and did all this and while he was sleeping. Like, come on, that's ridiculous. Like, <laughs> It's and that's the same issue I had with the lodge with a lot of the things that happened in that movie. And I, you know, I can't judge that movie and then not do that to this film because it's yeah, fair, but fair. Um, but yeah, like the I still enjoy it, but yeah, it's it loses me about I'd say the third act when he just kind of goes yeah. the full blown psycho route. But like, all in all, like, yeah, this one the representation is kind of there for christmas but like i say it's just decorating nothing special yeah but i agree i'll say so i think krampus is pretty much the epitome of what we need when it comes to the christmas horror so Um, just let's write a letter to michael doherty and say he's only allowed to make christmas horror films (laughs) moving forward yep and i'll say and since uh sorry bloom house and since we're talking about some films that have missed the mark when it comes to uh the holidays We uh, wanted to jump into our Out of the Dark segment with a topic of what is missing in holiday horror. And I, like, Heather and I were chatting about this, trying to think of an interesting topic. And when she brought this one up, I instantly came up with one that I thought would be really freaking cool. I even Googled it just to see if there was anything out there that I have not seen before that might have already done it. But uh, my idea would be I want to see a Hanukkah themed horror film but have it done as an anthology and call it Eight Bloody Nights and it'd be in a different day of Hanukkah and it's just a story representing each day of Hanukkah. Right. And I think that would be kind of a cool little way to do like an, a horror anthology for the holidays because there's not many Hanukkah themed horror films. I think there's only just like a two, three maybe. But like... Uh, yeah, we wanted to post this question to you as well, Xander. So did you end up coming up with some like some idea? Uh, well, it's the only thing, like, it's not exactly the same as you, but I I mean, I know we have, like, on this particular show, I talked about Spine Chillers, and then we have a ton of, like, Halloween-themed anthologies, but we really don't have a ton of, like, Christmas-themed anthologies, but it would be cool because, like, I feel like in Christmas, you could, like, take a lot of angles, right? Like, you could take uh we've gotten a ton of like deranged santa stories right but we don't necessarily have a ton of like deranged elves stories or deranged like reindeer stories um but we you know i feel like if we got more christmas anthology films i think it'd be really cool because and you could even like 
theme it to gifts, traditional gifts and all these other things in like different cultures. And you could really kind of like span Christmas over, you know, you know, every country has its own like, uh, like mythos behind Santa, right? And a lot of them are like, aren't positive, like ours is. A lot of them is like, oh, if you act bad, like I can't remember which one it is, um, but like Santa will come throw you in his bag and take you to his um, home and make you basically a slave if you're a bad kid. Like, he, oh, wow. like he, he shows up with six to eight people, beats you up, throws you in the bag and takes you basically to do like child labor if you're not a good kid. Jeez. Uh, which is kind of what the movie Scent is based off of, if you guys have seen that. or Saint. Okay, nope, I've, that's one I've been wanting to check out, actually. Okay, so it's based off that mythos is where, like, if you're a bad kid, Santa shows up with six to eight people and, like, throws you in the fucking bag and takes you off. Wow. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I just think Christmas anthology films are an easy way to uh, get everybody excited about Christmas, you know? Like, the time of year only comes once a year. Like, even if you're just doing a bunch of short films pieced together, like, I think a lot of people really gravitate to holiday horror and we still don't get enough of it so like i know there's a ton of anthologies for halloween but there's not any for christmas i would just love more christmas anthology films or an anthology film if you want to talk about all holidays like why don't we do an anthology film that has like here we go we start on halloween oh guess what now we have thanksgiving oh guess what now we have christmas oh guess what now we have a little segment on new year's like what if you had a little anthology you are describing into the darks (laughs) (laughs) So, but you're like you, good ones is what I'm asking ones. for. <laughs> yeah, so you know, I just want more of that stuff. That's why I just don't think we get enough of it, and I think people would eat it up easy because everybody wants it. So I like that. Uh, Heather, how about you? I think a lot of my ideas have been taken, um, which is great. Which means we're all super smart. Um, <laughs> I think that we could do more for Hanukkah as well. I think that we do a lot on North Americans view of Christmas and um, Santa and stuff like that. I think it's easy, low hanging fruit to do, to be quite honest. If we were to do something silly, I would like to see something with reindeer fighting back, like Rudolph getting pissed and being like, I'm done being made fun of. (laughs) Yeah. Making it like one of those like Jack Frost only like Rudolph. Yes. But that doesn't right. like talk, make it more like, you know, grizzly from the 70s yes. or something like that. Right. You know, that when nature fights back. Right. And it's just the reindeers doing stupid shit for <laughs> an hour and 20 minutes. Um, like doing I think LSD that... and drinking virgin blood. Is yes. Kind of right? Yes. <laughs> right. Like Sharknado only like reindeers. Um, I think that would be really fun. And I think Krampus did a very good job of making it serious. But I would, I don't know, like, I, I would like more Krampus movies, but better Krampus movies. Yeah, because after um, Krampus 2015 came out, there was, like, a flood of Krampus films, but they're And none all, of them like, are good. Bad. Yeah. Like, Mother yeah. Krampus, Krampus Reckoning, they're all terrible. The <laughs> only other Krampus that I've seen in a horror film would be that uh, Christmas Horror Story, and I recommend yeah. that one. You know, and I wouldn't mind seeing a remake of Black Christmas that actually follows Black Christmas, not... We don't need any more remakes of Black Christmas. <laughs> but like, but the other ones haven't been remakes. Black Xmas is not really a proper but, remake. But you and, don't need to fuck with Black Christmas, the original. But why Just can't don't. you take it and modernize it? See, no. I, I am all about remakes because it brings new people into the genre. Whether I, I, we don't, like it or not. I don't mind remakes either. That's just right? one of my favorites. And I think Black Xmas does a great job of just playing off the idea. Uh, I, I don't. I strongly disagree with a shot-for-shot remake of the original Black Christmas. See, I would be fine with that. I think it could be updated. And if it gets new people into the genre and we get people watching horror and we make more money from other films, yeah. sometimes you need that. You need the you low do. hanging. I, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree. Yeah, it's like, you know, what scared us and you know 1974 or whatever doesn't scare us now no like, and we just need you know, canadians to make it that would make it better yeah <laughs> like if we just had a canadian crew and you know yeah they would do a much better job oh just another random thought is like what would be fun about like some of the big franchises that we like like i would love to see like hey let's get uh you know you know everybody's been clamoring for a jason at Christmas time. Mm, yeah. Yes. It would be cool if some of these bigger franchise names started dropping in on that. So every everybody's been dying for a bloody Camp Crystal Lake in the winter. Yes. Well, fucking throw Freddy in there. Fucking throw Victor Crowley in there. Fucking throw throw everybody in there. Let's make a, all these Christmas versions of all the things we love would be amazing. And Absolutely. it would be cash cows. So I'm surprised that the studios haven't done it yet. 
And I think that's the thing with Christmas time, right? Is that you need to have those popular Christmas films that can be bring people in and then we get them into the classics. That's when you get horror fans hooked and you get them watching stuff that they wouldn't have normally watched. And I think your anthology idea is great. And especially if we had it from, and I watched an anthology recently that did have directors from different parts of the world Mm -hmm. uh, that was for the holidays. But I think if we had one that had more stories and we included countries from the continent, Africa, for example. So if we had Uganda or or other places that we're not as familiar with, and they're what they celebrate around this time of year, I think that we could make it even scarier because North Americans are already afraid of what they don't know. Um, yeah. So, so all true. you got to do is put it on steroids and they're going to be super scared. Um, and then you could have your campy, fun little like reindeer games or, you know, where reindeers fight back. It's, it's just, it's a genre that I agree could be explored a little bit more. Um with your really well done films and then your films that are just going to put butts in seats and get people into watching horror movies because really whether we like it or not that exists for a reason right um and it's yeah. existed in the hollywood since the beginning of time right and They've we just got to throw some sex movies. in there yeah. randomly like you could be having sex and rudolph shows up okay yes. right? <laughs> that's why that's why rudolph has a red nose he's so yeah that's right <laughs> someone took rudolph his girl actually we could do that <laughs> Um, you know, which actually, speaking of Christmas movies that I would like to see a roommate for, and I know everyone loves this claymation. I turned my I was, Christmas lights on, by the way. I know. I got excited when I saw that. The the 19, is it 1964 Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the claymation? I is that think, the year yeah. it came out? Yeah. You know, I wouldn't mind seeing an updated good version of that. Right. Like, a bloody Tim Burton version? Yes! <laughs> yes! I would love to see Tim Burton take that on. I think it'd be cool. <laughs> Oh, A Nightmare Johnny, Before Christmas. We didn't cover that one, but that's a, no, it's a, an it's awesome great. Christmas movie, Halloween movie, whatever you want to call it. That's a fun film. Yes, it is. Right. But yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I like all these ideas. I would uh, like, I would especially like you, we were saying earlier, I'd like to see a lot more like just kind of covering different traditions during the year. Or, yeah. yeah. During the time of year. It would be very interesting to see what would ha- like what people could come up, come up with. Exactly. Right. Yeah, we'll see what happens. But, um, you know, just, like, as, uh, just a uh, PSA, do not watch Black Christmas 2019, anybody, if you value the first Black Christmas. <laughs> or even Black Xmas. I like them both. Yeah. I, I do not like 2019. Uh, 2019 really should never been named Black Christmas. No, it, because it has it's, nothing it's to do nothing with it. nothing to do with it. And I will agree with you. Black Xmas at least was a little more. Plus, you had have, Andrea they, Martin in it. They have great kills in Black Xmas. They do. Not, and I love they the do. cookie cutter flesh eating scene. I was telling her that's the part I liked about and it. And it's a very yeah. 2006 movie. Like, you watch that movie and you're like, son of a bitch, this is mid 2000s. And you just it know that it is. There. Right? That? Um, yeah, it's great that she's in that, right? I know. And now she's in all the Hallmark Christmas movies. Like, oh, is she really? She is. Oh, boy. She was in the Christmas Waltz that I just recently watched. Do you, does, do you watch these movies? I watch Hallmark Christmas movies, yes. Oh, by yourself? Wow. Or is there someone uh, that watches them? My movies? wife likes them. So here's the thing like, <laughs> we watch them. And then, like, within 10 minutes, we have to make predictions. So, like, we'll open a bottle of wine or something and, like, start drinking. And, like, we don't read the synopsis. We just turn it on and, like, try to imagine where it goes and we take bets. Like, oh, You guys sound like you have an awesome marriage. This sounds yeah, like – That would be great. Fun. <laughs> Living your best life right there. It's pretty fun. Like, you know, all, the, all those Hallmark movies, like, they always have a good ending. But it's fun to, like, fuck with the plots and see how close you get. And we get pretty fucking close at this point of what happens. So imagine like one of those Hallmark movies and then it turns into a violent slasher halfway through. It'd be great. And like great. the dude just starts to like, or the chick doesn't give what she wants and she just starts cutting people up. That like, that's awesome. not a diamond ring, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go have my daddy get his tractor out the barn. He's going to run you over. That'd be great. Yes. That'd be awesome. All right, Scotty, do you want to close us out? Get yes. Xander to do his final plugs. Yeah, I would say. I uh, just want to say thank you, Xander, for joining us on this episode. This has been a uh, blast thank you having for, you on. Thank you for having me. It was an honor to be here. I'll say you have shown us that we are definitely amateurs in the horror genre. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we really oh, are. That's okay. No, 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 no. Uh, I appreciate but, the praise, but it's not deserved. But yeah, feel free to give plug to where people can find you on social <clears throat> media, your show. Yeah, yeah. So obviously you can check us out at cemeterygates.podbean.com. Um, we're also on Spotify and all the other places, but if you need our RSS feed, it's Cemetery Gates Podcast on uh, Podbean. 
Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Xander underscore Kane. If you want to follow me on there, that's, that's cool. I'll do a lot of, on my Instagram stories, I post a lot when I'm watching movies, I'll post a lot of like cut scenes from what I'm watching and movie posters and stuff like that. So you can kind of see what I'm watching uh, if you're interested. Also NSFW because some crazy shit pops up on there uh, from time to time. But, you know, that's why I put it in my story. So it disappears and I don't get flagged right. by Instagram. Smart. Uh, other than that, my actual Instagram posts are mostly of movies and my dog and beer. So, you know and the occasional selfie. But other than that, big follow there and on Twitter, same things and underscore Kane. And thank you guys a bajillion for having me. And uh, just, it was a wonderful day. And I hope everybody that's listening enjoyed the show and got some new movies that they haven't really heard about or just fucking had a good time listening to us because it was a blast. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Glad to have you on. Um, Heather, yeah, like you you're anything? really smart and... <laughs> I Quit feel like you know, I'm just going to steal every. No, I'm just going to steal everything you say, Xander. Okay. You're be like I, uh, I came up with this. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm like, no, I watch all the 70 movies. <laughs> I know <laughs> all of this stuff. <laughs> right, Scotty? It just means yeah. I have no life. That's all. That's all. <laughs> yes, it means you're a film connoisseur. Yes, 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 yes. But yes, it was a pleasure, Xander. I look forward to coming back on to um, your podcast because Scott's never been invited. So clearly, uh, yeah, we'll we'll get it back on the no. the reins here shortly. Uh, we usually yeah. take a break until after the new year. So you don't. And, and I got and we got to give Android crap because he never invites any of the guys from. It's not hard. I know he just he invites me. Just invites Heather every time. <laughs> no, he's, <laughs> he's like, like nah, Heather and Mona. That's it. That's it. He's he only knows two women, and you know what? It's hard for him. His wife's no, like, I'm the, not all, fucking interested. Right? All the other ones he knows are porn stars, so. right? And they're, <laughs> and they're too busy to come on, so he's down to really, really low hanging fruit. Which would be interesting. Odd, oddly, there's a, so when I first started like doing the horror stuff and on Twitter, there there was a very odd kinship between like horror movies and like adult actresses and like sex workers in general like loved horror so i built a bunch of weird relationships with like you that say whole crew, weird but, but i oh, hear they were great they're super stories kind of people. it's just a weird thing that i never expected but it's true like you know the porn world and the horror world somehow oddly collide i feel like we're going to have you on for a show in the future that's going to talk about that <laughs> yeah. All right, i feel then. like you have shown us you are knowledgeable and uh, uh, yeah, i try yeah, you're coming back <laughs> if you have us. Yes. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate, uh, celebrate it safely. Have a great time. Stay, uh, God, I hope this is the last time I say it this year. Stay safe. Um, yeah. Wear your Christmas masks, everybody. And we're all going to get through this. And here's to uh, hopefully uh, better 2021. I completely agree. So in the meantime, I guess, why don't you close this out finally, Scotty? All right. So, yeah, thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, until next time, unpleasant dreams. Ho, ho, ho. Yeah, <laughs> filthy animal. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Uh.